and we all saw it with the fiasco that this government uh, presided over last night. So, can we have a bit more clarity on what has really gone on, what exactly is happening? And I notice that the Minister has been somewhat selective in who he will answer in terms of immigration. Yeah. I think it's quite important that he gives us some clarity here and now on whether he is seriously defending the abhorrent policies of the former Home Secretary. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Lady for a question, but once again, you know, we are not here today to discuss specific policies, but we are also not here today to discuss um, gossip, we are not here to discuss rumours, and we are not here to discuss what people may think did or didn't go on yesterday, and this is a completely different issue. We are here to discuss the resignation of the Home Secretary for a breach of the Ministerial Code. And the Prime Minister has been very, very clear that she expects the highest standards in government, and all Ministers are expected to adhere to the Ministerial Code, and when they haven't and they have done a breach, they are expected to resign. And that is what the Home Secretary has done, as outlined in her letter. Lawrence Echelon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister and, and would have heard other members and right honourable members talk about the former Home Secretary's comments in terms of seeing refugees fly away. For us as members to talk about people seeking refuge, people fleeing from war, persecution, is deeply beneath this House and beneath the standards we should have. The, form, the current Chancellor, who, as we all know, is probably the Prime Minister, has said that he wants to see a more compassionate Conservative. Yeah. Can the Minister outline that the new Home Secretary will be outlining that compassion in when we are dealing and talking about people seeking asylum and refuge in our country? Yeah. <laughs> Minister. I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. And again, whilst I cannot discuss policy, what I would say is this government has shown compassion, not just in terms of the aid we give abroad, but I would point to the uh, Homes for Ukraine scheme. You look at what we've done there, before that with Syria, before that with Afghanistan. And this country has a proud history of welcoming refugees. That is something that will continue. That is something that this government has been committed to, will continue to be committed to, and is something that I am certainly also committed to. Uh, thank you very much. Speaker. Appointing a Home Secretary who lasted 43 days and a Chancellor who lasted 38 days is unprecedented and farcical. What does that say about the Prime Minister's judgment and fitness for office? She has no support anywhere in this House anymore. Shouldn't she be following her former colleagues to the back benches, pausing only to ask for a dissolution of Parliament? <laughs> Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I, I'd remind my honourable friend that appointments are a matter for the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has outlined what she expects in terms of conducts of ministers. And when the Prime Minister has changed her appointment, she has done it swiftly. Uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear on this, that she expects us to be working together towards our growth plan to deliver for the people of this country. And that is why she has taken the actions that she has. Dave Dugan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The former Home Secretary got her jotters because she was on manoeuvres, and the Cabinet at large is on manoeuvres to find out who is going to replace the Prime Minister. But the de facto Prime Minister, the Chancellor, did not want anybody's manoeuvres competing with his own. Yeah. Is not that the truth? It is nothing to do with that breach of the Code. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I would say to the uh, honourable gentleman, I, th I think the, uh, the the proof here is in the resignation letter of the Home Secretary herself. Her, the Home Secretary herself has outlined the reasons why she has resigned from her position. She has been very clear about the ministerial code, which areas it is that she has uh, breached, and of course, uh, as we say, other matters. Um, are, are to be treated separately. But why we are here today, once again, is to discuss why the Home Secretary resigned. We are not here to discuss other matters that involve internal party politics. Kate Green. The Minister may not want to discuss immigration policy today, but I hope he will share my deep concern at the written answer I received on Tuesday from the Home Office revealing that nearly 900 under 16-year-old asylum-seeking children have been accommodated in hotels and the Chief Inspector for Borders and Immigration report this week that some of the hotel staff don't even have DBS clearance. Will he go back to the Home Office immediately after this question to urge action to get those children out of those hotels and into a place of safety? Thanks. 
So, thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question, and I am happy to pass it on to the Home Office and ask them that question so they can provide you with that information. But, of course, we do remain committed uh, to safeguarding children, uh, whether that is children in this country or children that we have received coming into the country. Wayne Dave. The Minister has referred to the uh, former Home Secretary's letter of resignation. But in that letter of resignation, she said, and I quote exactly, uh, the document was a draft written ministerial statement due for publication imminently. Much of it had already been briefed to MPs. <coughs> Would he confirm that that is the case, and I suspect it is the case, then we all know full well what the real reason for her resignation was, don't we? Minister. Th thank you, Mr Speaker. I, th I think I uh, covered this previously, but um, I I'm happy to repeat for the Honourable Gentleman. Um, you know, ha having this on a, a personal email account and then sharing outside of the government does constitute a clear breach of the code, and that is there in section 2.14, it's there in section 2.3, and if it's helpful, again, people may wish to look at this. But again, the Prime Minister has been clear that security of government business is absolutely paramount, and that is why we are holding held ministers to the highest standards, and the Home Secretary tendered her resignation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a mess. This is a mess. I appreciate the minister's got a really bad time having to defend this. But can he ask? Uh, can I ask him whether he has asked other cabinet members whether they've shared sensitive documents on their personal emails? Have they been asked? Has that extended to other platforms like WhatsApp, Telegram, or Signal? Will they be? Uh, will there be a full check of the former Home Secretary's phone to make sure? That it's not just personal email, but other social networks and, and communication apps that may have been used in this. Because at the moment, the minister is not reassuring this house nor the public that the security of our sensitive national uh, national security is being properly looked after by this government. Can he give that reassurance? And if he does not know now. Will he come back to this House with a full disclosure of what apps were used, what documents were shared, and whether every single member of the government have been checked? Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, um, I agree with my honourable friend that it is very important that documents are kept secure. Uh, this is why it is kept separate from uh, personal emails and so on. And This is something that ministers are reminded of, including myself uh, as a new minister um, with the uh, big thick rule book, of course, that we, we have that we have to read through. Uh, but what I would also say is that uh, you know, we've made it clear where there are breaches. Uh, there is a, a method for reporting that. We would take advice, of course, from the Cabinet Secretary regarding that. And uh, I'm sure um, if there are further breaches, that they will be made aware to members of this House in future. Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The dogs in the street can see the chaos at the heart of this government and the Home Secretary's departure, the full truth of which we still don't know even after today, is not even the latest example of the chaos that we've seen since her departure. As we face huge economic challenges, a cost of Tory crisis, we probably have not needed stronger and more decisive leadership today than we have since World War II. So can the Minister explain to the House if he thinks the UK has the strong and decisive leadership that it needs? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. And I absolutely do have that strong and decisive leadership. And it was strong and decisive leadership uh, that received the resignation of the Home Secretary and then appointed another Home Secretary the same afternoon. And as the Prime Minister has been very clear, uh, the Prime Minister wants to move forward. She wants to move quickly to deliver for the people of this country. And that is why appointments have been made. And of course, with the breadth of talent on the back benches that we currently have, there's a wide pool of talent to choose from. And I'm glad that we're in this situation rather than having to send our front bench on training courses as the opposition have had to do recently. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, but increased immigration would tackle labour shortages and increase the tax take. Ending the hostile uh, environment would improve vastly government efficiency. So given that growing the economy and cutting government spendings are supposed to be government priorities. When will we hear from the new Home Secretary on how home office, home office policy is going to align with the Prime Minister's stated aims? 
Minister. Th thank you, Mr Speaker. I mean, if increased immigration is the SNP's policy, then that is obviously a, a policy for him. In terms of our policies, I think we've been very clear that we want to attract the brightest and best talent to this country, but at the same time making sure we have a firm but fair immigration system. And again, whilst today is not a, a day for policy, I am pleased that we have replaced the Home Secretary swiftly and we're able to continue the good work that we're currently doing in these areas. We now come to the next UQ, Ian Duncan Smith. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to ask, the Secretary of State, to ask the Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs if he would make a statement on the role of the Chinese Consul General, who it appears now took part in the assault of Bob Chen. Minister. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I am very grateful to my honourable friend for his question, uh, and also deeply aware of the strength of feeling in this House and in the other place about the scenes of violence at the Consulate General of the People's Republic of China in Manchester on Sunday afternoon, and I am very happy to provide an update on our response. You have been kind enough, Mr. Speaker, to indicate that you might allow me to speak for a few more minutes, a couple more minutes, just to set out the position. Uh, as the House will know, on Sunday afternoon, officials were in touch with Greater Manchester Police regarding the incident. On Monday, officials spoke to the Chinese Embassy to express our very serious concerns at the reports and to demand an explanation. And uh, FCDO officials were clear that all diplomats and consular staff based in the UK must respect UK laws and regulations. On Tuesday, I announced in this House that the Foreign Secretary had issued a summons to express His Majesty's Government deep concern at the incident and to demand an explanation for the apparent actions of the staff of the Consulate General. Following my statement, the Chinese chargé d'affaires attended the summons at the FCDO in his capacity as acting ambassador. For the avoidance of any doubt, the Chinese ambassador is currently out of the UK and therefore it is standard practice in such circumstances to summon the chargé d'affaires. And also, if I may be clear, receiving an official summons from the Foreign Secretary is not, as it has been described, a light rap on the knuckles, but the delivery of a stern message well understood within the context of diplomatic protocol. It is customary for senior officials to deliver such messages. Uh, these uh, summings are not an invitation for an ambassador to have an audience with the Foreign Secretary or with ministers. In any case, given that it was a charge d'affaires, it was doubly appropriate that it should be delivered by a senior official. In the summons, the official set out that peaceful protest is a fundamental part of British society and that everyone in the United Kingdom has the right to express their views peacefully without fear of violence. He reiterated our clear expectation that diplomatic and consular staff should conduct themselves in accordance with UK law. And we have made it absolutely clear to the Chinese Embassy that the apparent behaviour of consulate general officials during the incident, as it appears from the footage, which even now more of which is coming out as we uh, discuss this, is completely unacceptable. Now, the independent police investigation is now underway. Greater Manchester Police has been clear that there are strands, many strands, to what is a complex and sensitive inquiry and that it may take some time. As the Foreign Secretary has said, we will await the details of the investigation, but in the meantime, I have instructed our Ambassador to deliver a clear message directly to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing about the depth of concern at the apparent actions by Consulate General Staff. And let me be clear that if the police determine that there are grounds to charge any officials, we would expect the Chinese Consulate to waive immunity for those officials. If they do not, then diplomatic consequences will follow. Finally, if I may, allow me to reiterate to this House the value we place on the Hong Kong community in the UK. When the national security law was imposed on Hong Kong in 2020, this government acted immediately in announcing the scheme for British national overseas status holders and their, and their dependents. Since then, over 100,000 people and their families have made the decision to move to the UK to live, work and make this their new home. And I want to put on record here now again today officially a, reaff a reaffirmation of our unwavering support for them and our commitment to their safety. They are most welcome here. Recognising the interest that this issue has across this House, Mr Speaker, the Government will seek to update the House on this matter next week with your permission. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am grateful to you for granting this UQ, and I follow from the uh, UQ by my honourable friend. I say to my right honourable friend, just for the purposes of the House, it is worth reminding everybody uh, what happened at the Chinese consulate. Uh, in the grounds on Sunday, an appalling attack took place on a peaceful protester who was dragged into the consulate grounds and uh, seriously abused. And we saw those appalling videos of Bob Chen being dragged into those grounds and abused. And it now appears 
uh, that the Consul General played a part in that physical attack. Mr Chan uh, is a Hong Kong refugee who we have welcomed over here. I and others are working uh, to help those get out of Hong Kong across the floor. We have worked together. And that, that community now feels very frightened uh, by what is going on in the UK by the Chinese government's representatives. And he, Mr Chen, gave a statement for the first time to the media yesterday, Mr Speaker. And it was a very moving statement. Uh, he spoke of how badly bruised and damaged he is and how frightened he is. And his wife and child were in the room as well at the same time. I thought it was very brave of him uh, because he now fears being targeted by the Chinese Communist Party here in the United Kingdom. So I say to my right honourable uh, uh, right friend that now overnight we discover that the Consul General has himself admitted that not only did he take part in this attack, but that he was responsible in his own words for pulling his hair and tearing his scalp. This is the Consul General, let alone the others that were there. So I like many others, uh, members of IPAC and others within this House, have worked together on helping Hong Kong refugees, and I credit the government in the work that they have done to get them over here on the BNOs. But I now urge the government to be much, much clearer than just using diplomatic language. I urge the government to make it clear, in the light of this new evidence, that it's not just unacceptable that any consular individual should have taken part in anything like this, but that any consulate individual who has proved to have been one of the perpetrators of this outrageous and violent attack on Mr Chen will be made persona non grata immediately and sent back to China. The government has the diplomatic power to dismiss them. Whether or not there are criminal proceedings, the fact is we do not want them here in the UK and they must go. And I urge my right honourable friend to come to the dispatch box and show the resolution that is necessary to send that message to China, despite what others and officials may say, be careful of tit for tat. Ignore that. Get to the dispatch box and simply say they will leave the United Kingdom. Any one of them that was in on that attack is not welcome, and the ambassador will be informed of that forthwith. Minister. Well, I thank my right honourable friend very much indeed for his further remarks. Uh, we should be absolutely clear that participating in an assault, if that is what we, uh, is determined to have happened, uh, uh, is completely outside the expectations of our rule of law, that we would expect, if such a thing had taken place, as a question was raised in the House uh, only two days ago, in front of a British consulate in Shanghai, we would, of course, refer the matter to the local policing authorities as would have been expected to have been done in this case. So I take the point the normal gentleman makes uh, very strongly. Uh, and of course, he's also right to insist, as he insisted in the previous uh, uh, question that we discussed on this, that the diplomatic channel and the legal channel are uh, distinct. And I have seen the footage that he describes, and I have to say I think it looks very black indeed and damning indeed. But there is a process that we're going through and we need to make a factual determination. And once that is done, as I have said, uh, diplomatic consequences, if it is found to have been as uh, uh, we fear it may be, that is to say a criminal offence of some kind, diplomatic consequences will follow. We now come to the Shadow Minister, Catherine West. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for um, Chingford Woodford Green for bringing this urgent question and for the um, interview which he had with Mr Chen yesterday um, and the uh, work that he has done on this. This is yet another complete failure of the government. Instead of bringing a statement to this House, which would be the normal way of carrying on, this is the second urgent question that members of this House have had to bring. And what is more concerning, Mr. Speaker, is the outrageous admission of the Chinese Consul General that he did in fact assault Hong Kong democracy protesters in Manchester, which he described as his duty. The government's handling of this has been a complete mess, and the Minister will know that Labour has called for the Chinese Ambassador to be summoned to demand an explanation, but in a stunning abdication of their failure of their duties, an FCDO statement confirmed that a civil servant held the meeting with the Minister. Uh, young, rather than the Foreign Secretary or a responsible minister. 
While I have the utmost confidence in the abilities of FCDO officials to fulfil their responsibilities, there are moments in foreign policy where only a minister and an elected minister will do. Sadly, Mr Speaker, it appears that this chaotic government has unleashed upon the country through its failed economic agenda and is now hampering ministers' ability to stand up for the most basic rights which we hold dear. The minister has the chance to send a clear message, not just to the Chinese government, but to the government in Myanmar and any other country which might have repressive regimes and where refugees fear for their fa safety in this country. He will know that in, on the 12th of May, from this dispatch box, uh, we challenged the government to come forward with a comprehensive plan for safety for Hong Kong nationals and others. So two questions. Will he now meet the embassy without any delay to communicate the strong message from us as MPs about the importance of peaceful protest in this country. And on the question of the CCTV footage, is it the case that the Greater Manchester Police have not yet received the footage because the Consular General is refusing to hand it over? What will he do to tackle this problem? Is it possible for him to expel the individual and then for that individual to apply to return and that way round, at least we would know that the government had taken the strongest action possible. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, uh, and I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. And of course, she's absolutely right to pay tribute to my Honourable Friend for his interview uh, with Mr Chen. I think that was a very important moment, and uh, he deserves congratulation from across this House for that. Um, in terms of what she actually said, however, I don't think she can have listened to what I said, and it's a pity. The ambassador is not in the United Kingdom and has not been in the United Kingdom uh, since before the beginning of, last, uh, of this week, and therefore he's not available for uh, any kind of diplomatic interaction. The chargé d'affaires is, in fact, in any case, the appropriate person for this kind of uh, exchange. The last time that an ambassador was summoned to uh, a meeting with a minister, uh, uh, indeed the foreign minister, was following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which gives you a sense of the way in which the diplomatic niceties uh, work out. Uh, in terms of um, CCTV and the Greater Manchester Police, I'm afraid I can't comment on that since it's um, a matter uh, outside the purview of the government, but I would certainly encourage, uh, if it is the case, the, that the Chinese consulate is not giving up any uh, CCTV that it has, then I would certainly encourage them to do so. Chair of the Select Committee, unless you can. I welcome this UQ by my right honourable friend. It is quite clear that the House is unhappy with the course that the government has taken. And I'm afraid I must challenge my right honourable friend on some of the comments he has made this morning. It is not apparent involvement. There are no ifs, there are no buts. The Consul yeah. General has not only admitted, as my right honourable friend said, that he's responsible, but he has praised his role in these actions and said he would do it again. It is a political decision to expel, not a policing decision. So can he please confirm, as he suggested from the dispatch just now, that his preference is to prosecute these individuals and to see them in British prisons? And secondly, what are the diplomatic consequences that he references? Is it to expel? We need plain speaking at this time. The House is clearly united in our position, and I urge the government to listen to it. Yeah. Well, Minister. Well, I, I thank the uh, Chairman of the Select Committee. And um, sh she has made clear her view that uh, a crime uh, was committed here, and uh, I think th that is the view that uh, many others have taken. But it is not, in fact, I think, a, a determination of fact at the level that we would need. And uh, she may have uh, missed the portion of what I said earlier to uh, my honourable friend uh, who put the question that we recognise that the diplomatic channel and the legal channel are separate, but they're not separate as regards a determination of fact. And that is, I think, the proper grounds for us to make, a, 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 as a government, a, determi a determination. Uh, as regards the uh, 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 political desire, um, we, will be regard we will be looking at the fact situation as it's brought forward, uh, at the options. I've said there will be, as you may have missed this too, an update, in, I would expect, to the House next week as uh, further events uh, break, uh, play themselves out. Uh, and uh, we will make a judgment in due course on that basis. Sempe Sempe's first person, Angela Crawley. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, this is a serious diplomatic incident, and others have said that the scenes of the violent clash between pro democracy protesters and the officials at the Chinese consulate are disturbing and go directly to the, against the tents of demo, diplomacy, freedom of speech, and protest. Now, Bob Chan, who has fled from Hong Kong for his life, was pulled through the gates into the consulate and beaten by staff. He was left with cuts and bruises to his face, and a video footage shows here being pulled by the Chinese consulate. He has already admitted that this was his duty. Now, the SNP condemned this violence against peaceful protesters in the strongest possible terms and called for an urgent investigation. If these individuals responsible for such violence cannot be criminally prosecuted due to diplomatic immunity, they must be formally expelled from the UK. What actions will the Minister commit to to take hold of the Consulate General and take account both in domestic law and international law? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I have set out the actions we are proposing to take at the moment, and uh, of course we recognise, and I said in terms, the seriousness of this uh, matter. And of course we also recognise the seriousness with which the House takes this matter. Uh, now, uh, uh, as to uh, the Consul General's remarks about it being its duty, I think um, they are sufficiently uh, absurd not to require comment from the dispatch box. Tim Morton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the steadfast support that you have continued yeah, yeah, to show yeah, yeah. those that are sanctioned by uh, China. The Consulate General seems to have forgotten he was in Manchester, where we allow free speech, and thought he was in Lhasa, Hong Kong, or Xinjiang, where peaceful demonstration is routinely met by violence from the authorities. This does not require clear messages in due course, as the Minister has just said. This requires strong action now, which involves chucking out some of these people, and it involves posting additional police outside every Chinese government establishment in this country to make sure that no more peaceful demonstrators are attacked in this way, because many Uyghur families and many Tibetan families already feel intimidated. Now they can be dragged into Chinese premises and beaten up or worse. Mr. Uh, well, I, again, I thank my honourable friend for his question. The, uh, the point about he's, he's, he's right to raise the contrast between our own rule of law and the uh, deplorable, uh, despicable experience uh, of the Uyghurs in, that has been meted out to the Uyghurs in uh, Xinjiang. Uh, he will know that only last week uh, 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 the UN Human Rights Commission debated this matter on the back of a extraordinarily damning report by former President Bachelet uh, of Chile, and that is now uh, in the public domain. Uh, as regards uh, police support, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, I think it is a fact about this that the uh, demonstration was notified to the Greater Manchester Police. They were on hand uh, at the time, and so uh, it is not absolutely clear that police support as such is what is required. Uh, it, there clearly has been some kind of failure in this case, uh, and we need to work out if there was what it was. Um. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, I joined Bob Chan in a press conference in which he bravely detailed the awful ordeal in my constituency. In an interview with Sky News reporter Inzi Rashid, the Chinese Consul General in Manchester has now confirmed that the footage did show him destroying banners and assaulting protesters, which he argued was his duty. The hyobras and the above-the-law attitude of the Consul General is sickening. Will the government stop dragging their feet and take immediate action by declaring the Consul General persona non grata? Minister. Well, I thank my friend, and of course, he too um, has engaged very closely with Mr. Chan, and very, very welcome that is too. And I thank him. Uh, I'm sure from all everyone around this house, we congratulate him and thank him for his support on that. Uh, he has, in his question, revisited questions I've already uh, debated at some length and announced from the dispatch box. We have put in place a series of measures which we are going through now, and in due course, we will expect to update the house uh, on progress in this developing situation. Richard Holden. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank you, sir, for your continued efforts in this direction and to hold the Chinese to account and help us do so in this House. Um, but there is, uh, could the Minister just ask, answer a question quickly about there's, a, there's another protest this weekend in Manchester. Um, will, uh, has the Minister contacted uh, Greater Manchester Police already to ensure that those protesters who are there um, can have the protection of Greater Manchester Police, which they clearly haven't had to date? Uh, well, uh, again, I thank the honourable gentleman for his question. I, I personally wasn't aware of the 
uh, uh, further demonstrations. Uh, the House has now been made aware of them. I will ensure that uh, officials uh, make some notification. This is a Home Office matter, so it will go through the Home Office. And of course, even within the, the Home Office uh, uh, network of relationships, our police are independent of government, rightly so, for the best rule of law reasons, and so we will respect that. Uh, I'm not sure yet uh, that what happened here necessarily was a failure of policing in this case. It certainly appears that way, and we would expect the Great Manchester Police to be able to do whatever they can next time round. Lola Brown. Mr Speaker, frankly, this is now just ridiculous, yes. and I hope that the Period. Minister can see the force of the will of the House, and I hope that helps him in what he needs to do next. Article 41 of the Vienna Convention for Diplomatic Relations says that diplomats need to respect the law and regulations of the receiving state. And Article 9 says that the receiving state has the right to declare that person persona non grata at any time with no explanation. The CPS then says that that is done when the police have sufficient evidence to justify court proceedings. Now, given the video, given the admission, the lack of action by the government is frankly laughable at this point. This is now a political decision. Can he explain why he is not making them persona non grata now? Minister. The, the, the Honourable Lady uh, quotes the um, uh, Convention, and it's very interesting, but she skated over the key phrase, which was when the police have sufficient evidence. And we're not in that position yet. And when they are, as I have assured the House, there will be consequences if that evidence proves to be dispositive. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My, my right honourable friend is a diplomat. I understand that. But does he not understand? Does he not understand that if this assault took place on the streets of this country, the individuals responsible would be in prison cells and before magistrates? Therefore, it's very simple. Every single day that those responsible remain on these shores yeah. <coughs> is a disgrace and a stain on our society. Certainly. So can we not take the decision now yep. to encourage my honourable friend and his colleagues to expel the people responsible today? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Uh, uh, of course, the House has a very strong view on this, and I fully recognise it. But of course, if this, if, if this. If this apparent offence had taken place elsewhere on the streets of the United Kingdom, it would be subject to the same kind of police investigation and determination and uh, potentially a prosecution and a prosecution potentially uh, as a result. Chris Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the Minister to his post because I know him to be a decent, intelligent and honourable man. Um, but he talks of diplomatic niceties. The time for diplomatic niceties is long, long past. Do you think the Chinese government cares about diplomatic niceties? Of course what the minister should be doing is saying to the ambassador, get yourself back to Britain so that you can meet with the minister. And if you don't get back, it'll be a minister that's going to be meeting with the chargé d'affaires on Monday morning, or preferably tomorrow. And for that matter, we will be expelling the consul general tomorrow because he's clearly been engaged in something which would have got him arrested if it had happened on the, on the streets of, of the United Kingdom. Minister. Uh, well, uh, uh, I think the fact of the matter is that uh, we have already laid out a, uh, an approach to this. As I said, the last time a, uh, uh, an ambassador was summoned to the Foreign Secretary it was in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There are uh, uh, diplomatic channels to which these things occur, and we need to respect them. As regards the question of arrest, a person, an individual, might have been arrested or they might not have been arrested. That's in the discretion uh, of the police, uh, and that remains the case whether they are outside the embassy or on any other parts of our streets. Navandru Mishra. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Minister outline what tangible steps have been taken to protect Hong Kong community, Tibetans, Uyghurs from intimidation, threats and actual use of violence from the Chinese state on UK soil? Tangible steps. Minister. Well, he knows that we've, of course, opened the BNO channel. We have offered uh, uh, support from uh, the Home Office and for, from the Department for Housing, Leveling Up and Communities uh, to them, and they remain under the rule of law and, therefore, the um, purview of the police, as would any other residents in this country. Okay. The power 
the right to protest, Mr speak, Speaker, is a British value, and it stems from 1819 and the Poli Peterloo massacre in our great city. And that's why it's gnawing at our moral core around the inaction of this uh, government. I'll say this to the Minister. Powerlessness corrupts. Absolute powerlessness corrupts. Absolutely. And government is being sclerotic in this case if, it, if it's not part of the wider malaise. But in the spirit that the Minister also knows that I think he's honourable, can he tell us what discussions he's been having with either the Mayor of Greater Manchester, the Leader of Manchester City Council or Greater Manchester Police to the, reassure the people in our great city that action will be taken. Yeah. Well, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is a, a Manchester MP and I absolutely respect the force of his uh, passion in this issue. Um, and as with the member for the Rondo, there's nothing more deadly than when a, a member of the uh, opposition is kind about the gentleman at the dispatch box. So I'm aware of the danger of that. Uh, I would correct him on the issue of um, the rule of law and due process. It goes back in this country way before uh, Peter Liu, and uh, one would think of it as something um, um, the, the, co the codification or formalisation of um, legal changes in, this, in the 17th century. Um, uh, he brilliantly misquotes, he immediately, if not earlier, if not, if not earlier, if, 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 if not earlier, he, um, he, he brilliantly misquotes um, uh, Lord Acton. Let me say, in relation to the Greater Manchester Police, that this is a matter for the Home Office. But I can be absolutely certain, as he can, that they will be following this debate with considerable interest. Kate Green. A few moments ago, the Minister characterised the Consul General's comment that it was his duty to commit an act of violence as absurd. With the greatest respect to the Minister, whom I like very much, I think it was sinister and menacing. It is not just that this House cares about seeing. Consul General and others involved in this incident face immediate what he calls diplomatic consequences. Hong Kong nationals now obtaining refuge in my constituency also need the reassurance that the government Absolutely. takes their security seriously. As long as these people remain in Manchester, in this country, they do not have that reassurance. Minister. Oh, well, I, I, again, I thank the Honourable Lady. Uh, I, I don't, if I may say so, think that she's right about uh, the position that I've taken. We have been perfectly clear about the concern felt across uh, interested bodies and parties and groups in the UK, and in particular Hong, uh, Hong Kong residents uh, here and people who have come from Hong Kong. And that is why I ended my statement with a very specific message to them to say uh, of support. Uh, to them. And I have also outlined to this House the measures that we have uh, put in place and the other departments focus on those people. Uh, it is true that they too would expect to live under the rule of law of our police, and I think the Greater Manchester Police in general do a sterling job, and I am sure any Manchester MP would say that, of protecting the well-being of the people of Manchester, and I am sure they will continue to extend that privilege and that uh, courtesy and that protection to um, Hong Kong residents as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't going to intervene in this if I was listening to the responses of the Minister. There can be no question here of the failure of the Manchester Police. No one would have expected a bunch of thugs to come running out of a, 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 an embassy and beat people up on the streets of Britain. Does the, does the Minister think for a minute just about what, how this appears and his answering today makes our country look? We look supine and weak. The evidence is absolutely clear, and he should be stating that today and making it clear that the government will act and will act swiftly. And I get no urgency from the minister today. Minister. Uh, well, of course, I'm afraid that's hopelessly untrue. We take this extremely seriously. We're acting on it. We've had two UKs on the matter. We've got different departments uh, engaged and involved. I can confirm. I, I've since had it confirmed to me that um, uh, officials have been in touch with the Greater Manchester Police, and they will remain so. Of course, I mean no uh, criticism of, of anyone in that final gust body of police men and women, but we absolutely continue to look to them to maintain uh, the kind of standards of policing that they always have done in that city. Mr. Speaker, it, it strikes me that there isn't any dubiety 
in this House at all about the appalling scenes that we have all witnessed. And as a signatory of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, the UK has got a, a diplomatic but also a moral responsibility to the people of Hong Kong, especially the large numbers who came to the UK under the new visa scheme. So does he not accept that there is a need for clear action to make sure that Hong Kong people and Uyghurs and Tibetans feel safe and feel valued here? Well, well of, of course I do, and the Honourable Lady may recall that on Tuesday I announced that the um, uh, British National uh, Overseas Channel had been extended uh, to include um, uh, uh, adult uh, relatives of those who are um, already entitled to uh, its um, benefits. So we, and, and I've also outlined to the House not just our very warm and enthusiastic embrace of the people of Hong Kong uh, through that channel, but also the measures uh, and the departments responsible for protecting those people in this country. And again, I send a very strong message to Hong Kongers in this country that we massively respect and warmly embrace you. And of course, we will continue to protect and look to your safety. Jim Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, it's been quite difficult uh, um, for to listen to the answers, and I say that with great respect to the Minister because we don't really feel that maybe the, the issue has been taken strongly enough. The Minister will be aware that this latest travesty in, is simply one in a long list of despicable attacks on innocent people taking place argu arguably at the hands of those in power in China. Uh, will the Minister make a, a determination to meet with the Ambassador to highlight that the behaviour of taking someone from British soil on, onto the Chinese consulate to abuse them physically and violently within the consulate is disgraceful, will not be tolerated, and that those involved, including the ambassador, will be sent home immediately. Solves the problem. Minister. I'm an enormous fan and admirer of the Honourable Gentleman, but we have covered this question quite closely on several occasions in this uh, urgent question, and we will take the measures that we've, uh, I have outlined. They are a clear extension of the work we are doing already, both in this country and in Beijing, and we will await the factual determination on the evidence, and then we will take action if that is required. That completes that question. Question: We now come to the statement. I call Minister Caroline Johnson. Thank you. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I would like to make a statement on the review into East Kent Maternity Services. Few things could be as tragic as the death of a child, yet knowing that that death was wholly, unavoid wholly avoidable comes with its own unimaginable pain. It is thanks to the tireless efforts of families in East Kent, their courage and their determination, that we have been able to shine a light on maternity failings in East Kent Hospital's University Trust. Dr Bill Kirkup's report, published yesterday, has some stark and upsetting findings. In examining over 200 births in the Trust between 2009 and 2020, he found that, had care been given at nationally recognised standards, 45 babies might not have lost their lives. And many more families may not have experienced such distress at what should have been their time of joy. He also found a toxic culture within the Trust, with a disturbing lack of kindness and compassion. And victims' families even blamed for their devastating losses. Before I say more, Mr Speaker, I want to say this. I am profoundly sorry to all the families affected. This should never have happened, and we will work tirelessly to put it right. Mr Speaker, with the report published just yesterday, I am sure honourable members will understand our need to carefully consider all of its details. I will be reviewing all of the recommendations and will issue a full response once I have had time to consider them. But given the gravity of what the report reveals, I felt it was important to come to the House today and update colleagues on the steps we are already taking to improve maternity services in East Kent and across the country. Turning to the report itself, it is a litany of failure that makes for very difficult reading. It details failures of team working, failures of professionalism, failures of compassion, failures to listen, failures after safety incidents, and ultimately a failure of leadership. The review heard about women and family members feeling patronised, ignored, or told off. One woman hearing from a doctor, some parents just aren't supposed to have children. Some people felt they were unimportant 
or too much trouble. One woman reportedly was told by a staff member that they were sorry for her loss, but their baby was dead, and there were other babies who were living who still needed attending to. These kind of failures showed up at every level of patient care, with no discernible improvement over the whole time frame of the review. The trust failed to read the signals, and they missed every opportunity to put things right. Mr Speaker, these are difficult things to hear, and especially hard because I know so many of us have experienced for ourselves the brilliant care that NHS maternity services can offer. We must take nothing away from the hundreds of thousands of incredible people working day and night in maternity services across the country. Yet we cannot pretend that the story of East Kent is a one-off. Reviews from Morecambe Bay to Shrewsbury and Telford paint a more disturbing picture. While they may be some of the most extreme examples, and we must hope they are, they are certainly not isolated incidents. And colleagues will know that just last month, Donna Ockendon began her new independent review into maternity services at Nottingham University hospitals. We entrust the NHS with our care when we are at our most vulnerable. Everyone has the right to expect the same high quality care, no matter who they are or where they live. Mr Speaker, we are already taking a number of steps to improve the quality of maternity care in East Kent and across the country. An intensive programme of maternity support was put in place at East Kent's Hospitals University Trust in September 2019 overseen by NHS England, the Kent and Medway Integrated Care System and the Trust Board. And the Trust has been allocated a Maternity Improvement Advisor and an Obstetric Improvement Advisor. Mr Speaker, we will also continue to ensure the high standards at national level. I am grateful to Dr Kirkup for the extensive recommendations in his report, but it is vital they are not viewed in isolation. As Dr Kirkup has said himself, since his Morecambe Bay investigation in 2015. Maternity services have been the subject of more significant policy initiatives than any other service. So his recommendations must be considered alongside existing work to improve maternity outcomes. First, there is our independent working group. The group is one of the key immediate and essential actions from the Ockenden Review and has now begun its important work. The group, chaired by the Royal College of Midwives, and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists is advising the Maternity Transformation Programme in England on how they can take forward the findings of both the Orkenden and the Kirkup reports. Next, our new, quality maternity, sorry, our new maternity quality surveillance framework is a vital tool for proactively identifying problems in trusts so they can get support before serious issues arise. And in March 2022, NHS England announced a £127 million funding boost for maternity services across England to help ensure safer and more personalised care for women and their babies. But even with this essential work, we recognise there is still a long way to go and much more work to be done to put things right. In closing, Mr Speaker, I want to thank Dr Kirkup and his team. His experience has been invaluable and I know his approach of putting families first has been welcomed. I also know that hearing the accounts of families has been a harrowing experience at times. Yet, as he has said, it's difficult to imagine just how much harder it was for those families as they relived some of their darkest days. So I'm sure the whole House will also join me in paying tribute to those families whose tireless determination to find the truth and tell their stories has brought us to this important point. Nothing we can do can bring back the children that they have lost or fill the tragic void of a life never lived. But now we know their stories, we will listen, learn and act so that no other family should ever experience such pain. I commend this statement to the House. Now I come to Shadow Minister Farrell Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for um, the advanced sight of her statements. I thank Dr Bill Kirkup and his team for the report. Today marks another milestone for another group of families in their fight for justice. The heartbreak they will feel must be unimaginable, and my first thoughts remains with them during what must be an incredibly difficult time. 
Sadly, this is another example of women's voices not just being ignored, but being silenced. When women in East Kent were told that they were to blame for their baby's death, they were being told that their voices just did not matter. At a time when women are at their most vulnerable, they were let down by the very people they were relying on to keep them safe. Mr Speaker, after responding to the Ockenden Review from Shrewsbury and Telford, I find myself having to repeat something that I never thought I would need to say once again at this dispatch box. No woman should ever have to face going into hospital to give birth and not know whether she and her baby will come out alive. No one. It isn't a case of a few bad apples. What happened at East Kent, just like what happened at Shrewsbury and Telford and Morecambe Bay, was years of systemic negligence that cost lives. As you heard today, just a minute ago, up to 45 babies could have survived had they received the better care. That's 45 lives cut needlessly short. 45 families made to suffer the most devastating heartbreak. Whilst I'm heartbroken for the families that this review had to take place, it is vital that it did. Nobody that allowed this culture of neglect to set in should be able to escape accountability. Such a review has been necessary again because for too long, people turned a blind eye and tolerated the intolerable. That's why it cannot be allowed to sit on the shelf in the Department of Health and gather dust. We must see action if we are going to give women the care they need and deserve. There is a pattern of avoidable harm in maternity units across the country. Nearly 2,000 reported cases of, of avoidable harm at Shrewsbury and Telford. Half of maternity units in England are considered failing, uh, are failing to meet safety standards. Pregnant women were turned away from maternity wards more than 400 times last year. One in four women are unable to get the help they need when in labour. That is why it's so important that the government must accept fully all of the re recommendations made in Do Dr Kirkup's review without delay. Mr Speaker, this is a collective failure and we've all got to learn lessons from this. In the wake up of Ockenden Review, the Right Honourable Member for Bromsgrove announced an extra £127 million of funding for maternity services to help deliver the reform that is so clearly needed. So can I ask the Minister where that money is? I will be grateful to hear from the Minister where that has been spent, what it has been spent on and how the impact um, it has will be measured because underpinning the issues in maternity care as across the NHS is workforce. More midwives are leaving the profession than joining. There is now a shortage of, of over 2,000 midwives in England. We just don't have the staff needed to provide good and safe care. Even the Chancellor agrees, Mr Speaker. Last week, he signed the report as co-chair of the APPG on baby loss and maternity that calls maternity and neonatal services understaffed, overstretched and letting down women, families and maternity staff. He went on to call for safe levels of staffing. So will the Minister deliver on their Chancellor's promise? The government must provide the staff maternity services so desperately need to provide safe care across our NHS as Labour have a plan to. Because, Mr Speaker, having the confidence that they will be safe is all women are asking for, and it really isn't much. It's high time the government deliver it. Thank you. Yeah. Minister. I um, thank the Honourable Lady for her questions. Um, the report does paint a tragic and harrowing picture of poor maternity care at uh, East, East Kent Hospital. And the lady talks about accountability. She will um, be aware that the trust um, board has changed in terms of chief executive and chairman, and that the new, um, those new interposed are working hard to ensure that things are turned around and things improve. She talked about funding and workforce, and I understand why she does that. But actually, if she reads the report, it's clear from Dr Kirkup's report that um, th these were not the causative factor in this case. This was about culture and workplace practice 
uh, not, not money and staffing levels. Um, the money, she asked how the money has been spent. It's been spent on well, uh, staffing and workforce and training. Um, she also asked about um, uh, she also asked about um, the culture and how that's going to be measured. So it's being looked at in several ways, particularly in terms of the outcomes, so the outcome in terms of healthy babies, but also the outcomes in terms of mother's experience of their care. So Roger Gay. Mr Speaker, first, thank you so much for facilitating this statement. Um, you know that as not just the constituency member of Parliament, but as a father and a grandfather, this is a matter of profound importance to me personally. Can I welcome the Minister to the dispatch box for the first time and thank her for the tone of her remarks? Mr. Speaker, nothing is going to bring back the children that were lost in the Margate unit. Nothing is going to erase the pain felt and continuing to be felt by the parents. I'd like to commend them for the quiet dignity with which they have fought their cause under horrific circumstances for so long. And I'd also like, if I may, craving your indulgence, to thank Bill Kirkup and his team for the sensitivity with which they have handled this and listen to the harrowing stories from so very many people, stories that should never have had to have been told. What we can do is to try to put this right for the future, so that this never ever happens to another family again. It will come at a cost, and with the Treasury Minister on the bench, I have to say that there is £33 million worth of investment that is now needed immediately in the maternity unit at Margate. But Mr Speaker, what I would simply like to do at this stage is ask my honourable friend from the dispatch box to tell me that she is willing to bring her medical ex expertise, which is considerable, to Margate, to come to see herself, the unit, to meet the staff, to meet with the new chief executive and the new chairman who are determined to do their utmost to make amends and to do so as swiftly as possible. Thank you. I thank my right honourable friend for his comments and I note that he has been a doubted campaigner on this issue and I know how much this matters to him personally as well as as a member of parliament. Um, I would of course be happy to come to uh, Margate to meet with the staff as he described. Rosie Duffield. Thank you Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for her statement and Dr Kirkup and his team and the families and staff who took part in the inquiry. It's clear that there's been an utterly toxic and dysfunctional culture within maternity services at East Kent Hospitals Trust and it's shocking and disturbing and made much, so much worse by the revelation that the Trust tried to cover these cases up. Mothers were treated appallingly and babies died. I cannot comprehend what they've had to endure and I am so angry on their behalf. How can the Minister assure my constituents that action leading to immediate change will not involve any of the staff and managers involved directly in these cases, given that for, and given that former staff and a governor have said that they publicly cannot recommend the, staff, the service? How can MPs in East Kent tell our constituencies, our constituents that our maternity services are now safe? Minister. I think... Right Honourable Lady, for her question, and I know that this is a matter on which she has been campaigning furiously on behalf of her constituents. I share her anger and her shock when I read the report at some of the cases and some of the ways in which patients have been spoken to during the time at the hospital. It, it, it's, it's, it's truly unforgivable. Um, in terms of the question of safety, that was my first question when, when I read the report, is are we sure that the patients going in today to have their babies are safe to do so? Um, so I met with um, Anne Eden, who's the regional director of NHSE, uh, yesterday to talk to her about the safety. I have been reassured both in terms of quality and, quant and, and outcomes. In terms of outcomes, I've been reassured that the, uh, looking at crude data, which I appreciate is not published yet, the number of stillbirths and neonatal deaths over the last year or so have fallen substantially. And in terms of quality, they're doing a review. Obviously, each woman is contacted six weeks after her delivery uh, to ask about uh, her experiences and where experiences have not been as they should be, although they are in almost all cases. Where they've not been as they should be, that's been further investigated in each case. 
Damien Green. Just, just the chapter. This report is a terrible read, particularly, obviously, for bereaved parents who have gone through untold anguish, including some at the William Harvey Hospital in my constituency. And, and what makes me particularly angry is that this was going on for more than a decade under several different management regimes at the Trust. So can uh, the Minister give some reassurance to women in Ashford who are about to have a baby at the William Harvey that they will be treated safely and respectfully? And can she assure the House, looking further afield, that the terrible repeated examples of similar tragedies and scandals around the NHS are now at an end? I thank my honourable friend, right honourable friend, for his for his question, and I, and I know that he also shares the House's um, desire to ensure that such uh, events do not reoccur and to ensure that his constituents are safe. Um, he asked about how the, um, the failures over time, and, and in fact, there were signs uh, as early as 2010 that there were problems being raised with this trust, and the failure is not so much as the, the need to, to find those problems, but actually that they weren't, they weren't properly dealt with when they were found. Um, I have received assurances yesterday from the Regional Director of NHS England, uh, that, uh, in the way I described uh, a few moments ago, uh, and I will be re meeting with, the, with her regularly to have updates to ensure that this um, process is not just um, uh, put in place, but also followed through. Clive Apple. Mr. Speaker, the, the stories of the families are really harrowing to read, and I hear what the minister says that staff shortages can't be used to ex excuse the poor practice that uh, uh, has taken place. But nonetheless, it is disturbing that the NHS England has abandoned it, it, its uh, uh, safety targets under the uh, midwifery continuity and care model. Uh, and I wonder if the minister could say, when we have more. Uh, uh, midwives leaving the, the, the profession and coming into it as a matter of urgency in order to avoid these sorts of occurrences in other places what the government is going to do to turn around that loss of midwives so um, thank the honourable gentleman for his question so um, NHS England have announced they're investing an additional £127 million into maternity system in the next year this money will go towards maternity workforce and improving neonatal care. There is also, um, in addition to that, £95 million invested last year to support the establishment of more than 1,200 more midwifery posts and 100 more consultant obstetric posts. Um, work is already underway as part of the biggest nursing, midwifery and allied healthcare professional recruitment drive in decades. So this will help us to increase the number of uh, midwives uh, on, in East Kent but also elsewhere. Hello, Waitley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank my honourable friend for her statement and particularly for the tone in which she makes it? Dr Kirkup's report is harrowing reading, but nothing compared to the harrowing experiences of the parents whose babies were severely injured at birth, stillborn or lost in the days after they were born, particularly when so many of those incidents were avoidable. It's a shocking litany of clinical and management mistakes, missed opportunities, failures to take responsibility and an incomprehensible normalisation of baby death, despite all the efforts to improve safety since the Midstaff's scandal. Can I ask my honourable friend, firstly, to put herself in the shoes of an expectant mum, which I know as a mum she will be able to do as well as from her experience as a clinician, and can she categorically assure me and all the parents-to-be who are soon to have babies in East Kent Trust, that the maternity units in these hospitals are safe for them to give birth. And secondly, can I say to her, while there are worthwhile sections on the actions in the report, and I commend Dr Kerper for his report, the report doesn't get to the bottom of the problem, which is truly one of accountability. Can she assure me that never again will a trust find reasons to excuse catastrophic outcomes, or never again can critical reports be dismissed as a load of rubbish, I quote from the report, or never again could staff blame patients for a hospital's failings. But instead, can I ask her, how will she assure herself as a minister? I know this is a difficult 
uh, role that every single maternity unit in every single hospital across the country <coughs> is safe for mothers to give birth. Minister. I thank my honourable friend for, for her question and, and I know that she has campaigned hard both as a minister and as a, as a backbench MP for safety in the National Health Service. Um, in terms of safety at uh, East Kent Trust, we've, 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 we've talked about already how they, um, the regional team are, are there. There's also a maternity safety support team who are in the Trust working actively on the ground to ensure that um, the lessons are learned and that services are improved. Um, I've been given some uh, figures that demonstrate that the um, outcomes are improving and as I talked earlier there are steps in place to ensure the quality of service and to feedback the quality of service to ensure no woman is spoken to in the way described in the report. Uh, from a wider perspective we're looking at um, both the workforce as described but also how we ensure that problems are not just picked up but they're actually um, developed and followed through. Uh, we're also looking at the, uh, the report, the CARC report, which looked at how managers are responsible and held responsible, and we'll be um, talking for more about that in due course. Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of my constituents have raised the point that black women in the UK are four times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth. So can the Minister explain what action is being taken to end this scandal? I thank the Honourable Lady for her question. So, on a, on a wider perspective, the um, uh, government has a target of reducing stillbirths and neonatal deaths uh, cr across, across, across the country, and that obviously includes women of colour uh, too. What was particularly shocking about this report, coming hard on the hills of Shrewsbury uh, and Morecambe Bay, was the culture of cover up it, it reveals, the lack of empathy extraordinarily amongst staff, and the fact it took parents and grandparents like Derek Richford to campaign to get the expose that has now uh, come out. Does she agree with me that given that there were stillbirths involved here, where live-born children were described as being stillborn so coroners could not investigate, it underlines yet again the need for my Civil Partnerships Deaths and Births Act, three and a half years ago passed by this House, which give powers to coroners to investigate stillbirths to come into force at last. Will she go and speak to the Justice Secretary and liaise between her department to get that measure enacted straight away to give some confidence to those parents who have been through these terrible experiences? I thank my honourable friend for his question. I understand his passion uh, in, in this area. I'd be happy to meet with him to discuss it further. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We've seen several tragedies in health and social care services across the country. Both the, the Ockenden Review from earlier this year and this recent upsetting report by Dr Kirkup highlight serious multiple failings. It should go without saying that health outcomes should never be determined by location. We must tackle the inequalities that exist between rural and urban maternity services to ensure that people living in rural and coastal areas can access the same range of birthing methods and support. So will the Minister support the Maternity Services Rural Areas Bill, which was brought forward by my Liberal Democrat colleague, the member for St Albans, to end maternity service inequalities for people living in rural and coastal areas? I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. As a rural a Member of Parliament myself, I understand the need for uh, rural services to be just as good as those in more urban areas. Um, and to ensure that they're, um, they're, they're improved when not uh, adequate. Um, the, um, there is a medical education reform programme which is a jointly co-sponsored um, project between NHS England and the NHEE. It's expected to direct investment for specialty training more towards area population need to smaller and rural hospitals, and this programme implements is, has entered its implementation phase from August 2022. <coughs> Um, Morecambe Bay, East Kent, James Padgett and Shrewsbury and Telford are included in the current smaller hospitals uh, list. Um, I'm not certain about the hospital and the gentleman's constituency, but I can find that information and write to him about it. James Morris. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. Um, this is clearly a shocking and disturbing report, and I find myself agreeing with the Shadow Minister when she said that this is, represents a serious collective failure um, across um, our maternity services, because I I know that it's not just an isolated incident. 
Um, would the Minister agree with me that there is a role here to be played by the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch that has set up a stream of work in relation to maternity services? So could she redouble her efforts in, in, in conjunction with that body to make sure that we learn the lessons of the cultural failures in this case and that that learning is spread throughout the system because that's the only way that we have an opportunity of making sure that these things don't happen again. I thank my honourable friend for his uh, question. The, an honourable gentleman will be aware that within HSIB, the government is, is, is establishing a new special health authority specifically for maternity investigations with specialist expertise. Um, this independent body will continue the work of HSIB from 2023. Uh, in the meantime, maternity investigations will continue without interruption until it's fully operational. Yeah. Jim Shannon. Uh, um, Mr. Speaker, can I uh, first of all welcome the Honourable Lady to her place? Uh, we're very pleased to have her expertise and knowledge in, in that role as Minister, and I think that this House will benefit from that. Uh, I'd also like to express, on behalf of myself and my party, my sincere sympathies uh, to all of those who have lost loved ones. Uh, um, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that we all have the, uh, those families very much in our thoughts and our prayers. Uh, will the Minister outline what discussions have taken place with the devolved health trusts, uh, devolved nations, for instance, uh, to information share uh, and to ensure that UK wide reform, as it is clear that the pressures that led to this terrible scenario in Kent are ready to be replicated throughout the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, as midwives battle with understaffed, unsupported, and exhausted wards which are on the brink of life and death disasters. Through no fault of individuals, midwives who will carry that all to their graves. I know the, the Minister is committed to making it better. How can we do that for all of this great United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? Thank you. Thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. It is, of course, important that information is shared across our great country uh, and, and so that people in all areas of um, of our nation uh, get the best quality care. Uh, health is, devol is a devolved issue, but I will continue to work with the ministers from the devolved uh, nations to ensure that we share the lessons and indeed learn from each other. Robert Courts. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. My constituent, uh, Helen Gittos, healthy, full-term daughter Harriet, died in 2014. She said too often during pregnancy, in labour and afterwards. Rather than being listened to, we were treated dismissively, contemptuously and without a desire for understanding. It is hard enough to come to terms with the death of a child. It is even harder when you are implicitly blamed for what has happened. Mr Deputy Speaker, would the Minister commit to ensuring the implementation of all five recommendations, to begin the process of doing so by recess, and to make an oral statement to the House detailing what progress has been made, again, by recess. I thank my honourable friend for his question, and I know he shares my horror uh, at the report and my horror at the way women and their families were treated um, at East Kent maternity hospitals. Um, the report was only published uh, yesterday. And we'll be considering it. I will be considering it very, very carefully, and we'll come to the House to update further uh, in due course. That concludes uh, that statement. I'd like to thank the Minister. We're now moving on to uh, a statement by the Secretary of State for Defence on Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And wish, with permission, I would like to make a statement on the ongoing conflict uh, in Ukraine. We are now 239 days into the operation President Putin planned to conclude within a month. Active Ukrainian offensive operations continue in the northeast, near Safatovi, and the Kirshon region in the south. If Ukraine successfully advances on Sivatov, a key road and rail junction, it will constitute another severe blow to the logistical viability of the northern sector of Russia's Donbass front. Yesterday, the new Russian commander in Ukraine. General Sergei Surovikin offered an unusual and candid public statement of the difficulty of the Russian position in Hershon on the right bank of the Dnieper River. Pro-Russian occupation forces have now started to withdraw from categories of, with some categories of civilian east of the river. They claim 7,000 people have already departed and aim to move another 10,000 a day, though we cannot yet verify those figures. 
Russia's limited hold on the, right, on the bank of the Dnieper looks shaky. They are likely more seriously considering a drawdown of their forces in the area. Russia's ground campaign is being reversed. It is running out of modern long-range missiles, and its military hierarchy is floundering. They are struggling to find junior officers to lead the rank and file. Meanwhile, their latest overall commander has a 30-year record of thuggery marked even by the standards of the Russian army. What will worry President Putin is the open criticism is inching closer and closer to the political leadership uh, of his country. Russia has strong-armed Belarus into facilitating its disastrous war, but the newly announced Russian-Belarusian group of forces supposedly to be deployed in Belarus is unlikely to be a credible offensive force. It is far more likely that Russia is attempting to divert Ukrainian forces from their successful counter-offences. As Russia's forces are pushed back, they are resorting to directly striking Ukraine's critical national infrastructure, especially the power grid. It should be noted that these facilities have no direct military role, but the impact is multiplying the misery of ordinary Ukrainian citizens. Notably, these strikes are partially being conducted by loitering munitions, so-called kamikaze drones. Despite Tehran's denials, these weapons are being provided by Iran. This in itself is another sign of the strategic degradation of Russia's military. In wake of these ongoing and indiscriminate attacks on civilian infrastructure, the UK will continue and is continuing to gift air defence missiles to Ukraine. We are proud to be the second largest donor of military equipment, and last week I announced the UK will be providing an additional air defence missiles to Ukraine to defend against Russian missile strikes. These include AMRAAM air-to-air missiles which, used in conjunction with NASAM's air defence pledged by the United States, are capable of shooting down cruise missiles. We continue to provide sophisticated electronic warfare equipment, which gives additional protection against long-range drones and missiles. Supporting Ukraine remains the Ministry of Defence's main effort. We are helping Ukraine replenish their stops to keep us fighting. And as winter approaches, we are developing a package of support to support Ukrainians through the winter including 25,000 sets of winter clothing, so they are more effective on the battlefield than their poorly trained, badly prepared and ill-equipped Russian counterparts, many of whom have been mobilised at short notice with little training, equipment or preparation. As part of Operation Interflex, we are also continuing to train Ukrainian recruits in the United Kingdom, alongside our Canadian, Danish, Dutch, Finnish, Lithuanian, New Zealand, Norwegian and Swedish partners. We have so far trained over 7,000 soldiers and are currently on track to attend 10,000 by the end of the year, with up to 20,000 to follow in the year 2023. Furthermore, we have worked with allies and partners to establish an international fund which will ensure continued supply of essential, lethal and non-lethal military support to Ukraine, as well as manufacturing capacity. To date, we have received pledges totalling approximately £600 million and continue to work with international partners to secure further funding. Today, we will launch the first urgent bidding round to identify and procure critical capabilities which can be rapidly deployed to Ukraine. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would also like to share with the House details of a recent incident which occurred in international airspace over the Black Sea. On the 29th of September, an unarmed RAF RC-135 rivet joint, a civilian I-Star aircraft, on routine patrol over the Black Sea was interacted with by two Russian armed Su-27 fighter aircraft. It is not unusual for aircraft to be shadowed, and this day was no different. During that interaction, however, it transpired that one of the Su-27 aircraft released a missile in the vicinity of the RAF rivet joint beyond visual range. The total time of the interaction between the Russian aircraft and the rivet joint was approximately 90 minutes. The patrol completed and the aircraft returned to its base. In light of this potentially dangerous engagement, I have communicated my concerns directly to my Russian counterpart, Defence Minister Shoigu, and the Chief of Defence Staff in uh, Moscow, and, and has done so, my colleague, the Chief of Defence Staff, has also communicated his concerns. In my letter, I made clear that the aircraft was unarmed in international airspace and following a pre-notified flight path. I felt it was prudent to suspend these patrols until a response was received by the Russian state. 
The reply by the Russian Ministry of Defence on 10 October stated that they have conducted an investigation into the circumstances of the incident and say stated it was a technical malfunction of the Su-27 fighter. They also acknowledged that the incident took place in international airspace. The UK Ministry of Defence has shared this information with allies, and after consultation, I have restarted routine patrols, but this time escorted by fighter aircraft. Everything we do is considered and calibrated with regard to ongoing conflict in the region and in accordance with international law. We welcome Russia's acknowledgement that this was an international airspace, and the UK has conducted regular sorties of the RAF rivet joint in international airspace over the Black Sea since 2019, and we will continue to do so. For security reasons, I will not provide further commentary on the, of detail of these operations. But I want to assure the House that this incident will not prevent the United Kingdom's support for Ukraine and resistance to Russia's illegal invasion. The UK Government's position remains unchanged, with consistent support, uh, I am pleased, from across the House. We will continue to support the Ukrainian people to defend their homeland and the rules-based system. It has protected all nations from such naked and unprovoked aggression over the last 75 years, and it was also helped shape by Russia in that time. And this government will always defend it because this, these rules-based systems are fundamental to who we are, and it provides peace and security for this country and our partners and allies. Yeah, I commend yeah, the statement yeah, to the House. Yeah, yeah. Luke Pollard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I want to thank the Secretary of State for giving me advance sight of his statement. And at a time when there's much government chaos, can I thank him also for his calmness and professionalism in his job? The statement that the Defence Secretary has made around the incident with the RAF rivet joint surveillance aircraft is serious. The Defence Secretary has outlined that the correct steps were taken, a malfunction has been confirmed and the incident has now been resolved. It is welcome that RAF flights have restarted and there has been a clear recognition from Russia that the aircraft was flying in international airspace. The RAF have this House's full support and we are grateful to them, to other UK forces and our NATO allies in their work protecting the Alliance and protecting freedom. Yeah, yeah. This incident also acts as a serious reminder about the importance of avoiding escalation and miscalculation while continuing the UK's united support for Ukraine. Almost eight months on from Russia's criminal invasion of Ukraine, I want to pay tribute to the remarkable and continuing Russia, uh, Ukrainian resolve in the face of Russian aggression. Putin has made a huge strategic miscalculation in invading Ukraine, which has resulted in Russian forces suffering heavy losses. MOD estimates 25,000 Russian dead, tens of thousands injured, tens of thousands more deserted, and more than 4,000 armoured and protected vehicles destroyed. At a time where Ukrainians have shown incredible resilience in defending their homeland, Britain must continue to honour their bravery by remaining unwavering in our support for Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. I'm grateful that the Defence Secretary has set out the UK's continued support under Operation Interflex to train Ukrainian forces, and we thank those UK members of the armed services for their work in doing so. I'd be grateful if the Secretary of State now could confirm when the promised action plan in relation to continuing UK support for Ukraine will be published outlining the type and quantity of military, economic and diplomatic support which Ukraine will receive. Putin needs to be in no doubt that our resolve will continue, and whether it is his party or my party that is in charge, that will not change. I think it is also welcome, I think it is also time that the Defence Secretary makes a statement on the planned drawback of troops from Estonia and how that decision can be properly scrutinised, and grateful if the Secretary of State could set out whether the replacement NLAW missiles have been ordered, where the orders have been placed, and when our stockpiles will be replenished. There is a concerning uh, increase in Iranian drone activity, and I'd be grateful if the Secretary of State could also further set out what additional support can be taken by the UK and our allies to ensure that these uh, uh, Shahid 136 and the Mohajar 6 uh, drones from Iran can be properly intercepted and defeated to protect uh, uh, Ukrainian infrastructure. Finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, last night the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Satoni Radakin, uh, threw into doubt the planned rise to 3% of GDP on defence spending, when in a speech he said he referred to it as a potential increase. 
I'd be grateful if the Defence Secretary could spell out what is the Government's position on defence spending now and whether that increase is confirmed or whether it is, as uh, Admiral Sir Tony Radikin said, only a potential increase. Our support for Ukraine is unwavering on this side of the House, and the Defence Secretary knows that he has Labour's full support in the provision of uh, military aid to our friends in Ukraine. Putin must fail in his aggression, but as we enter an incredibly difficult period of this war, with cold weather drawing in, we must make sure that we are not only supporting our friends who are fighting in Ukraine, but also those civilians who they are fighting on behalf of. So I'd be grateful if the Minister could also set out what support the UK can offer to the civilian infrastructure, in particular protection of energy sources, that are so important not only for Ukrainian industry, but for their people as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Yeah, right. so uh, I'm uh, grateful to the Honourable Member for his questions. And uh, just uh, to assure the House, I didn't hold the statement uh, so that my counterpart on the front bench wasn't here. We, I spoke to him at length yesterday. And uh, to also assure the House that while there are some things that cannot be said in public, uh, or indeed even in this House uh, at the highest sensitivity, I continue an engagement with the leaders of the parties uh, at in the most sensitive areas to make sure they are fully apprised throughout this process. Uh, on the, you know, calibration is incredibly important to me. We are dealing with a President uh, and indeed a Russian forces who, uh, as we have seen from the rivet joint incident, are not beyond making the wrong calculation or indeed deciding that the rules don't apply to them. Uh, and that is why, uh, for those constituents of ours who will be fearful that this support could lead somewhere, uh, I, I, you know, I ask them to have faith in us and indeed uh, all of us uh, in this uh, uh, chamber, Mr Speaker, that we do work this uh, very detailed response to try and make sure we walk that sometimes tightrope, but make sure it is in the right place uh, to do it. Uh, on the uh, issue of the rivet joint, as, as I have said uh, earlier, we, we, we make sure it is uh, pre-declared. The flight path is not a surprise. Uh, that way we make sure it is no surprise to the Russians. Uh, it is logged in the normal manner, uh, and indeed I informed the Russians that they would be escorted as well, so there were no uh, surprises uh, to do that. Uh, on the subject of the action plan, uh, I, I think the Honourable Member is, is, is including also the broader government action plan, including fo foreign aid and support. Uh, first of all, I would concur with him that the foreign aid package and helping their economy uh, survive and stand on its feet and go from strength to strength is as important as the effect of the military response. Uh, I will press my colleagues in the other departments to make sure we get him those details of the actual time and date. But it is a fundamental plank uh, uh, for Ukraine uh, to make sure uh, we do that. Um, uh, part of the things I discussed when I was in the United States was uh, in that area there. Uh, on the issue of Estonia, the second battle group, which was deployed, if you will remember, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, after the invasion, a number of countries deployed uh, what we call enhanced forward presence groups uh, around Europe, in Bulgaria, in Romania. Uh, there was some talk about Hungary, but that did not materialise. And obviously, uh, in Lithuania, uh, Germany stepped up, and so did we in Estonia. The second battle group was always going to come back. It was uh, the second battle group. Our, our fixed position, effectively, in Estonia is a battle group which we vary in size and capability. Uh, so, in order to recognise the change threat, we have put in, or we will remain there, GMLRS, our longer range deep fires, uh, and indeed our air defence capabilities, which are not always in accompaniment with that battle group. So, we have effectively beefed up the existing battle group, but we need to return the next battle group back. Uh, 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 it has extended another six months, and I want to thank the men and women of the armed forces who extended out there. That will come back. Uh, we should not also forget we have a squadron of tanks in Poland, we have more forces, we have a company, a small battle group in Bulgaria, part of a US strike brigade, uh, and indeed we are now exploring uh, uh, some more Royal Engineers in Poland to assist with training Ukrainians and things like combat engineers. So uh, it, th that is why it came back. I, I engaged with my Estonian counterparts. I met them last week, uh, and again, I met them the week before in uh, Poland. Uh, to talk them through this. They were given prior notification. We are very, very keen to continue to work strongly with them. We have given an extra commitment on Estonia to have a brigade headquarters forward and a brigadier, in the same way the German plan in Lithuania is, at, is to allocate a brigade 
for fast response to deploy, and that's one of the ways we are seeking to uh, go. And we're also helping uh, Estonia develop its own divisional headquarters uh, hand in hand. But we always keep them under review, and we are all waiting for what we call the NATO regional plans that, in detail, will set out how our forces should be deployed across Europe uh, as part of a bigger comprehensive plan. And that's really important for all of us uh, to be guided uh, on that. On the Iranian drones, the Ukrainians are having success shooting a number of them down. It is the sheer scale. Uh, uh, members will not have missed the similarity between the V-1 rockets uh, and the use of this. Uh, I would uh, urge the Iranian government to understand that surely uh, supplying Russia to indiscriminately kill civilians, women and children, babies in prams is not an activity that Iran wants to be associated with, uh, and I would urge them to desist uh, as soon as possible. And we are not convinced by the denials from the Iranian government at all uh, that this is not being supplied by them. We will, however, invest uh, and use some of uh, our, our funding that I have talked about to invest in what other novel capabilities we can find to deploy. In the meantime, we are continually to supply and will step up our supply of our low-velocity missiles into Ukraine to work with the Stormer system uh, and uh, also make sure we can help with detection or electronic warfare schemes. Uh, obviously, the Ukrainian conflict has flushed out uh, you know, technologies that we all need in counter drone. Members of this House will remember the Gatwick Airport uh, scenario. It is, uh, everyone came up with magic solutions. I think my memory said when we actually tested them, nearly none of them did what they said at the tin, on the side of the tin at the time. But we are uh, rapidly helping, uh, and the best of innovation is being used to help the Ukrainians. On the 3 per cent of GDP, uh, uh, number 10 was very clear when I was in Washington that the 3 per cent commitment stood in 2030. I would be very interested if the Labour Party will match that in 2030. I think it is an important commitment. If they are getting ready for government, as they seem to think they are, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think those are the questions that they will need to answer the British public and the British Armed Forces uh, as they lay out their timetable and their plan. Uh, they will have two years to do it. Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, they'll have at least two years to do it, so I'm not, uh, I'm not too worried at seven, all. Seven uh, uh, um, but I, I, no, that's when the election, uh, I'm guessing, would be. Uh, but that is definitely above my pay grade. Uh, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, on the other issues around how we get them through the winter, uh, we are all working uh, both internationally to see what they can do. The European Union has announced uh, a fund uh, as well, uh, and we'll make sure that we do what we can to help them on critical national infrastructure and energy. Thank you. Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Alicia Cairns. Yeah, yeah. Can I thank my right honourable friend for his calmness and his consistency in his support for our friends in Ukraine. Our leadership on defence spending matters, and it is important we meet defence spending of 2.5% by 2026, because between now and 2050 it is spending and investing on tech and AI and quantum and new technologies that will now us to best protect ourselves from hostile states. But I am concerned about this escalation over the Black Sea, and I know he has a close, close relationship with his Turkish counterpart. So could he please give us an insight into how he's working with our allies in Turkey and Romania to protect air policing? Um, I'm grateful to my friend. One of the uh, uh, allies I discussed this with was Turkey uh, at the time of it happening. Uh, I have a very good and close relationship with the Turkish government. I'll be visiting Turkey next week. Uh, they are aware. And as ever, Turkey offered as much assistance uh, as, as they, they wished, uh, as we wished, uh, in, in this process. But we don't consider this a deliberate escalation by the Russian. Our, our analysis would concur it was a malfunction. However, it is a reminder uh, of quite how uh, dangerous uh, things can be when you choose to use your fighters in the manner that the Russians have done over many periods of time. Uh, while this was obviously the release of a weapon, uh, we have seen very, very close flying next to uh, US, UK, NATO assets over the last few years. Uh, in one event, I was aware of a Russian fighter with, went within 15 feet uh, of a NATO aircraft. Uh, you know, that is reckless, unnecessary, uh, and puts at risk many people's lives. And I am not also naive. What we saw over the Black Sea, we are incredibly lucky. Uh, that it didn't become worse, and I don't. Uh, I'm not trying to trivialise it at all, but we don't consider it a deliberate escalation by the Russian state. Andrew O'Hara. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and, and I too would like to thank the Secretary of State for advance sight of this statement. And I, I know my, my right honourable friend, the member for Ross Stanley Lacaber, appreciates the collegiate way which both he and his staff have acted throughout this crisis. Understandably, much of this attention 
of this statement will be focused on the incident involving the RAF's surveillance aircraft in the Russian Su-27 fighter, which took place, as we said, in international airspace on a pre-notified flight over the Black Sea last week. And I, and I wish to commend the Secretary of State and the Minister of Defence for their calm and measured response to a situation which could easily and very quickly have escalated into something far, far more serious. Of course, the situation in Ukraine is serious enough, with Putin now having annexed uh, and declared martial law in the four newly annexed territories, giving him a level of control over an industry which could possibly now be turned and repurposed into supporting his illegal war effort. And as the Secretary of State has said in recent days, we have seen more Russian war crimes in the targeting of Ukraine's civilians and civilian infrastructure with missiles, rockets and Iranian-made drones which makes, I believe, Iran directly complicit yeah. in war crimes. Yeah. When will the government follow the example of our US allies and our EU partners in actively pursuing and sanctioning those Iranian companies involved in making those drones, as well as the individuals involved in behind those companies? And could he maybe tell us what has been done, if anything, to try and cut off the supply of international components to Iran, which goes into making those components. And finally, echoing the, the state, the, what was said from the, the, the Labour front bench, as winter approaches and we continue to support militarily, what thought has been given to protecting the civilian population, particularly in terms of as a scope to send more generators or specialist electricity equipment to help keep the lights on and to keep the heating on for the Ukraine civilians this winter? I'm grateful to the honourable member. Uh, his, early, his, his last points are incredibly important. Uh, we already had quite significant work from the Department of Health uh, in this conflict about getting medical supplies, uh, but I think he, he prompts me uh, to see what we can do in a more international coordinated manner for exactly that. Now, I, I, am, I am aware of it, uh, but I would uh, potentially write to him with the full detail. But, but he is right. This is going to be a tough winter, and I think we need to make sure. Uh, I'd like to join him on the calmness of the RAF. They have you know, incredibly professional men and women doing uh, an incredible job, not only here. Some of those same aircraft and the P-8s from Lossiemouth go out and protect us in the north, the very high north, from uh, aggression uh, and Russian uh, uh, activity. And also, in, obviously, in Scotland, it is often where Russia does enter our airspace with its long-range bombers and patrols, a habit they didn't give up after the Cold War and still continue to do so. And I think here is the difference here. We were in international airspace, and I think that is uh, something uh, to remark. But we try, even though, and keep a professional uh, manner with the Russian it is important that we maintain that professional uh, uh, link with the Russian Ministry of Defence and recognise uh, that we can have those important engagements in times like this. Okay. Sir John Whittingdale. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, given the extraordinary success of the Ukrainian armed forces in pushing back Russian troops, does my right of friend agree that there is a danger that Putin may consider escalating the conflict? And while attention has focused on the potential use of battlefield nuclear weapons, will he agree that any use of chemical or biological weapons equally represents a red line which Putin must not cross? Um, our, our, you know, the OPWC, the, the, the convention that we are all uh, signed up to and indeed viewed as some of the key anchor countries to upholding that, uh, which saw us, obviously, if you remember, the use of chemical weapons in Syria, see uh, a number of actions, including us and France, take take uh, military uh, action is incredibly important, a uh, convention to uphold uh, breaking that taboo or allowing that to be, to be uh, successfully broken uh, would have severe consequences for all of us. Uh, uh, in the same way, uh, the messaging on the nuclear use, uh, chemical weapons would lead to severe consequences for the Russian uh, state uh, for it to do so, uh, and uh, we would urge uh, that none of these are resorted to. Uh, on President Putin's position, um, you know, he has obviously made a number of speeches, uh, annexed illegally parts of countries that are already still full of Ukrainian forces, uh, and uh, his ambitions don't seem to match the realities on the ground. I think the key here is to message to him that we are interested in helping Ukraine succeed 
in Ukraine in defeating Russia's illegal invasion in Ukraine. If he, if he understands what that is about, uh, then he should be able to calibrate his response in order to effectively orderly leave Ukraine and we can start the process of trying to rebuild that amazing country uh, and uh, for Russia to uh, be held accountable for its crimes. Kevin Jones. Can I thank the uh, uh, Defence Secretary for his statement and his leadership uh, <coughs> through this difficult time? Yes, yes. Can I also thank the members of our armed forces who yeah. are supporting uh, our efforts in Ukraine and also in Eastern Europe, and also the civil servants behind them in his own department? He mentioned in his statement uh, about uh, the Russians targeting drone attacks on civilians, but what has become very clear over the last few weeks is uh, Ukrainians have grown ground is the war crimes that have taken place against civilians and members of the armed forces in Ukraine. Could you just explain what expertise and support we're giving to the Ukrainians to actually log evidence and actually get that to be able to bring those individuals to account? Um, I'm grateful to that, Honourable Member. The, uh, earlier on, when we had the first uh, obviously exposure of, of war crimes in Butcher, uh, uh, not far outside of Kyiv. Uh, a group of us, including the United Kingdom, but alongside the Canadians, started that process of gathering evidence for the ICC. Uh, my uh, colleague, the, the uh, uh, now former Home Secretary, uh, was then the Attorney General. She visited Ukraine herself uh, and worked with the then prosecutor. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Red Cross is also clearly engaged in gathering uh, that information. Uh, I think their biggest challenge is, sheer, is, is the sheer scale of the amount of evidence they are now finding and uncovering. And it goes to the anxiousness of our friends in the Baltic states that Russia does not invade uh, and occupy with any civility or regard to the people that it is decided to occupy. It seems to destroy everything in its path. And if you are a small Baltic state, your worry is you don't have time for the rest of us to get there. It is why we are committed to a battle group in Estonia, because if you give him time or Russia time, there won't be very much left when you get there. That's why we have to send a message that this course is unacceptable. Robert Cords. Thank you very much, Chair. Deputy Speaker, and uh, can I thank um, the Secretary of State uh, for his uh, calm yet robust response uh, to the rivet joint uh, Sukhoi incident, which is, of course, of great concern. And I pay tribute uh, as well to the calmness and professionalism of the RAF crews uh, in that incident. Um, would the Secretary of State um, commit to continue to keep under review the adequacy of the fighter forces that we have available, bearing in mind the escort duties he's now referred to, uh, as well as the ongoing uh, combat air patrol? Uh, uh, air policing duties that there is on NATO's Eastern Front in any event? Uh, yes. Look, look, making sure we have more availability uh, and more of a fighter uh, aircraft capability in this country has been one of my priorities on the first day, almost the first day in taking over the job. My, uh, I sent a letter to the Chief of the Air Staff saying his number one priority was to improve the fighter pilot pipeline. There's no point buying planes if there's no one to fly them, uh, and it is incredibly important that we get that. Uh, of course, with a new type, the F-35, one of the challenges is you don't have growing instructors. It's a, it's a catch-22. You've got to have enough pilots in the planes to grow the instructor body, but if you don't uh, have enough uh, pilots in the first place, how do you do that? So we are getting there. It is improving. Uh, in the typhoon, the typhoon is proving its worth every single week. Uh, we have just, I went to the ceremony to hand over to Qatar the next iteration of the typhoon, a formidable aircraft, uh, and hopefully one that will be bought by many other countries around the world. Very Clark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can the um, Secretary of State elaborate on, because uh, you touched on it earlier, about the, um, the help that we're providing, such as um, we talked about equipment, in particular, whether you could tell us what we are doing um, in, in providing generators, energy generators, um, such as small diesel generators, to ensure that key services, such as hospitals or um, water cleaning um, plants, uh, keep going. Because um, given the Russian attack, of uh, Russia's attack on civilian infrastructure. Um, yes. Um, so first of all, uh, on non-lethal sort of military aid, uh, that is uh, collected and corralled in the same place we do with military, through the international uh, donor cell uh, based in uh, Germany. Uh, that is a multinational cell staffed predominantly by military and civil servants uh, who collect the ask from Ukraine, and then we try and match it with donors. Now, that is predominantly in the military aid and the non-lethal military aid, but that includes generators, uh, 
field hospitals, medical stuff for that, but predominantly that is on their war effort. Uh, I will make sure that we, we, we write to you with the, the broader detail of what other uh, assistance is happening. I visited Ukraine about three or four weeks ago, uh, and uh, they were in a pretty good mindset and, and their ability to see through the winter. But of course, this, uh, the use of mass drones from Iranian drones will have an effect if it continues, and we must make sure that doesn't catch up. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I did forget to uh, ask the question about on the sanctions uh, to the member of the Scottish National Party. What I would say, uh, my understanding is the Foreign Secretary will be making a statement uh, on that in the near future. Andrew Bridgen. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'd like to commend the Secretary of State for his statement today, but also for his ongoing handling of the UK response to the illegal invasion of Ukraine by President Putin. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I've, I've long been of the view that uh, spending on our armed forces should be really viewed as uh, an insurance policy to protect not only our security but also our national interests. And as with any insurance policy, when the risk profile increases, so must the premiums. Um, my right honourable friend has already confirmed, reconfirmed that the government is committed to raising defence spending to 3% of GDP by 2030. Given the acute security situation we find ourselves in at the moment, will he also commit to keeping that 2030 date under review? Uh, well, um, uh, my honourable friend is right, and I, I've often stood at the dispatch box and said, as the threat changes, so must our investment and our funding. And uh, I think that has been all too forgotten when it came to defence over the last three decades, to be honest. Uh, it was always interesting that we always understandably responded to pressures in the NHS or pressures in, in the financial markets, but when it came to a threat, it was always seemed as, as something that was not necessary, and I think uh, that is where you end up with a need, quite rightly, to go up to uh, 3% by 2030. Uh, of course, uh, we will always, well, as long as I'm the Defence Secretary, I'll keep the view that as threat changes, we should always review that threat. Uh, that is, I think, fair and consistent to the men and women of the armed forces. It also sends a strong message to people like President Putin that we mean what we say. Yeah. Yeah. John Spell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In answer to the challenge from the Secretary of State, I can say that our front bench is very ready for government, and by the way, his lot seems to be actively working to be ready for opposition. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. if I can address the statement, yeah. I thought it was helpful. But I also thought it ignored the gorilla in the room. Secretary of State urgently flew to Washington, D.C. earlier this week for talks on the situation in Ukraine. There's been quite a bit of briefing in the media as to what that may have been about. I fully understand the sensitivities of how this can be handled, but surely it's owed to the House and indeed to the nation to give some indication as to how we and our allies see this conflict evolving. Uh, so I'm grateful for that from my member. Him and I went to Washington ourselves, uh, now it seems decades ago, in calmer times. I was in opposition and he was on government, Mr. Baker. So he's well qualified to know what opposition is. Probably spent more time in opposition than government, sadly, obviously, for the right honourable member. But, but look, uh, uh, there's been a lot of, I would say, speculation rather than briefing on why I went to Washington. I, I noticed two mainstream media publications yesterday had different reasons why I went. Uh, look, fundamentally, President Putin makes his speeches things change. We need to be absolutely prepared to discuss that with our closest allies, uh, and sometimes that is important that we do so in person. I thought it was important, both after the appointment of the new general and also after the speeches President Putin has made about annexation and, indeed, uh, uh, the issues around uh, Ukraine's success on the battlefield and what that could mean for President Putin and his actions and what next. Uh, and I think that is very, very important that we do those things in, in person. I, I went to the Pentagon, the State Department, the National Security Advisor and other meetings and made sure uh, that we are all understanding uh, our planning processes about what we would do in the event of a whole range of things. Uh, I don't think people should be alarmed by it, but I do think they should, I would hope they would take comfort that my priority is, if necessary, getting on a plane to go and do that. It is not standing here necessarily, uh, well, across the street, uh, dealing with what is currently going on in our mainstream media. James Sunderland. Mr. Deputy Speaker, following the Defence Secretary's recent visit to Washington and other travels, could I please ask him to provide for the House a short assessment of the continuing resolve within NATO for supporting Ukraine, and so that we can also see this through? Um, my, my honourable friend will have noticed uh, two things in the last few weeks. One, uh, we had our NATO meeting last week, our defence ministers, and the resolve is absolutely rock solid. 
uh, and when it came to the nuclear issue, the, the line is, is, is consistent that there would be severe consequences for Russia should it use uh, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, and our commitment to uh, are obviously uh, responding to those type of issues and the threat it does to the world order or breaking nuclear taboo is, is, is determined and united. I think that is the same. You will also notice that the European Union itself has started to make much uh, 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 more, let me say, hawkish uh, 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 phrases uh, on that issue, and I think they, they say that because their member states are clearly resolved. They want this uh, successfully concluded. They recognise that the constituents in, in our country, but also in their, their, their countries, are facing higher food prices and energy prices because of the actions uh, of what is going on in Ukraine. And the, the quicker and, and, and more permanently we can solve that, uh, the better for all of us. And we can then get on and deal with the inflationary pressures and all the other stuff. Richard Ford. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, firstly, I'd like to say... Uh, well, I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for making this statement before the House. Uh, his transparency is, is very welcome and, and serves to avoid misreporting of the rivet joint incident and inadvertent escalation. We in the Liberal Democrats would like to add that we also uh, pay tribute to, to the professionalism, the values and standards of, of the Royal Air Force and of all of our armed forces. I particularly appreciate the Secretary of State's recognition that communication is crucial to ensuring that we avoid miscalculation. He said that he has communicated his concern directly to his Russian counterpart, Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu, and that the Chief of the Defence Staff has done the same using his channels. On the 7th of March this year, the Chief of Defence Staff's Admiral Sir Tony Radakin said that lines of communication were, quote, not as strong as we would want them to be. Can the Secretary of State comment on whether top-level lines of communication with Russian counterparts have deteriorated further or improved since then? I, I think what I would say to the honourable gentleman is it is possible for us to communicate with the leadership of the Russian Ministry of Defence and the, Russia, the leadership of the Russian government when we need to, uh, and uh, there, is also, there is a constant capability to do that. Uh, it, it is not particularly easy, uh, and it's not particularly easy across the international community at the moment, uh, either because, uh, obviously, uh, General Gerasimov and uh, Minister Shoigu are clearly engaged in the activity that has led us all to the House today, uh, and they are, are busy uh, uh, doing that. Uh, but it is possible, and I would assure the House that if it did become impossible, uh, I would seek other ways of making sure. I also have close allies and partners who can make uh, calls as well, if necessary, and we utilise all of them uh, where needed. Obviously. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Given all that is happening in Russia and Ukraine and elsewhere in the world, does the Defence Secretary agree that it is right that the Prime Minister has brought forward a commitment to a 2.5 per cent defence expenditure by 2026, because we cannot wait until 2030 to realise or to deal with the greater threats that we deal with now, that we face now? I, I think, first of all, foremost, 2030 is the key point, because to get to 3 per cent, you pass through all those percentages that he has talked about. Uh, and you know, the reality is we need to make sure that the rise to 3 per cent is done sustainably. You can't just give me a blob of money in 2029 and expect the government to buy a warship in five weeks and everything else has to be a, a, a proper graduated response. I will make sure that that response includes 2.5 per cent uh, of GDP en route to 3 per cent. Uh, I think it is also important to remind the House we are also part of NATO. Uh, NATO helps us achieve global, or certainly within North Atlantic, mass uh, and our ability to deploy very large numbers of troops. Uh, if necessary, and still, on paper, NATO far outnumbers uh, Russian forces. Yeah. After this event, yeah. where Russia has degraded nearly all its land armed forces significantly, uh, you will find that the ratio is even more imbalanced in favour of NATO. Yeah. Barry Sherman. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, can I say to the uh, Secretary of State that it gives me great uh, confidence this morning that we have a competent and trusted a Secretary of State and a competent and uh, trusted Shadow Secretary of State having an intelligent conversation about this and a question and answer session. And it, what our constituents expect to happen in this Parliament rather than 
recent events. But can I say to him, push him a little bit, he knows I've campaigned for a very long time for the credibility of our armed forces. Has to be around how many men and women we have. Uh, I campaigned for 100,000 minimum many years ago, and still I haven't got an answer whether the 72,000 aim in the most recent Conservative Party uh, manifesto is uh, policy is still w working. Uh, I'm supporting the 3% target for expenditure, uh, expenditure. And one last thing, please, more aid to the civilian population in these places that are being bombarded by the Russian uh, Air Force. I am grateful to the right honourable gentleman, and, and absolutely right. If at the end of this we don't help Ukraine rebuild itself, it will all have been for nothing. It is really important that alongside the military response, we help that economy uh, get on its feet. It has the means to, it has the agricultural produce, etc., etc. And I think it's really important, as he says, that, the, that not only is the military and the values the difference between Ukraine and Russia, it is also about the, the, the economic uh, levels uh, and the lack of the, the poverty and all that other issue that's so important. Look, on, on the credibility of our armed forces, it, we have to make sure that whatever size our armed forces are, they are properly protected, they are perfectly formed, uh, at the very forefront of capabilities, uh, and able to interoperate with and integrate with our biggest allies. Uh, that is really as important as the size of our armed forces. Russia went for size, and if you look, it can't talk to each other, it can't defend itself, and for all the boasts about how many BMPs and T-72s it's got, they all ended up dead or broken on the roads to Kiev. So it's a really important balance that we get. But like him, I believe that you also need to invest in your armed forces to deliver that, but have armed forces of scale to make sure you are able to be present around the world to deter your enemy so you, so you can make choices around who is in the Baltics and in Poland and in the Pacific and in Africa, where violent counter extremism is getting bigger and bigger and, and a threat to, to the stability of Africa uh, as well. So I agree with him. Uh, I'm having a meeting, I think, with the Treasury this afternoon. If you'd like to come with me, I'd be delighted to take him with me. Uh, I, 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 my, the Honourable Member, for many years, we've been in the same house together. Uh, he is a formidable uh, individual at delivering not only what he wishes to achieve, but also uh, uh, I remember him being formidable to his own front bench at certain times when they needed to hear the right messages. So he would be very welcome. If I could squeeze you into the Treasury meeting, I would. <laughs> Richard Holden. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to thank the uh, Secretary of State for his statement and uh, echo the comments of the whole House, including my, uh, the Honourable Member for North Durham, my neighbour, uh, in praising him for his leadership uh, during the uh, issues we've been facing uh, in, in Ukraine over the last few years. Um, obviously, in addition to the uh, supply of uh, lethal and non-lethal uh, weaponry and uh, supplies, uh, one of the big things the UK has been doing is help train Ukrainian Forces. Could my right honourable friend confirm just how many Ukrainian troops have been trained so far in the UK's training programmes, and also how many we're planning to train in the coming year? Uh, yes, um, 7,000 we've trained so far. We'll be on target to complete 10,000, and then uh, another 20,000 plus uh, the next year. It often depends on uh, whether the Ukrainians will. Al able to give us the training pipeline. Some of these people will be coming off the front lines yeah. to do that. It's, it's always a challenge, uh, but we're in the right position. We're well supported by the international community. It's making a difference. Uh, we are now looking at what else we can do in more uh, larger units, helping them train at company and battalion level, but that would probably happen within Europe. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. In describing Russia's increased targeting of Ukraine's energy infrastructure, which has led, as we've learned this morning, restrictions on power supply, the Secretary of State referred to the sheer quantity of cruise missiles and drones that are being used in those attacks. Is it now a question of just increasing the kind of equipment and capability that he has announced to the House today to enable Ukraine better to resist those attacks, or are there other capabilities, and he made reference to some, which could be supplied or which Ukraine has requested? Mm. Yes, I mean, from the international community, uh, for example, Ukraine has been consistently requesting from Israel uh, some of their electronic warfare, and it is regrettable that at the moment uh, Israel have not been choosing to do that. And uh, I will be seeing the Israeli ambassador uh, in the next few weeks to try and press the case. Because one of the challenges uh, of, uh, I've talked about it before, 
the precision, the, the proliferation of precision into the hands of basically low level troops is that we have highly sophisticated, complex weapons to shoot down these things. Uh, they take months to make, and they are originally designed for fighter aircraft. Uh, and you get fairly cheap mass drones. Uh, you run out of your complex weapons quicker than they can replace them. And that is one of the lessons of Ukraine. It's why electronic warfare plays a really important part, jamming or diverting or taking them over uh, as such. Uh, and it is why uh, that we will all be looking at our capabilities about what is the challenge to the future, how are we going to do that, as much as how we can help the Ukrainians. What we're doing right now is helping the Ukrainians, uh, and that is coming back into our system for ourselves. Tom Hunt. Speaker, I had the great privilege of attending a delegation uh, to Tapa British Army Base in Estonia um, last week, uh, where we met His Majesty's Ambassador in Estonia, who was doing an absolutely fantastic job. There's obviously a huge affection between the people of Estonia and Ukraine, which we saw at the Ukrainian ballet, which we had a great privilege of going to. I also met my constituent at Tapa Army Base. He's 19 tanks transporter squadron. I asked my constituent, Lawrence, um, how could I help you? How could I, what message could I take back to the uh, Secretary of State for Defence? And his whole thought was about the vehicles and how they're looked after and protected and maintained, not about himself. Would the Secretary of State join me in respecting the dedication of Lawrence, everybody else in 19 Tank Squadron, and also every one of those proud British um, armed service personnel working at Tapper Arm Base to keep us safe and also people of Estonia? Yes, um, my honourable friend is rather brave asking that question of a, of a soldier. I, I've often had <laughs> answers you didn't expect. I think he, he, he exposes the very real professionalism of our men and women. You know, we were always taught, and I've never forgotten it, uh, and forgive me uh, for the gender issue, but it was my men, my kit, myself. Uh, that is the difference between us and the Russians. Uh, the Russians don't seem to care about their men and their women. They seem to only care about themselves. Uh, and that is why you see their army doing what they're doing. Look, it is incredibly important that we have ready, capable uh, equipment. That is my point to the honourable member opposite, which is it's not just about mass. It has to be about properly serviced, properly maintained. The job your constituent is doing is one of the key things called the enablers. In the past, it was the enablers they hollowed out, as long as they could talk about having a frontline regiment or a frontline tank regiment. If you didn't have the transporters, there's no point in having lots of tanks, you won't go anywhere. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I uh, um, uh, thank the Secretary of State for his, his um, um, yeah. statement this morning? and. and uh, it's an encouragement for all of us here in this House to know that we have a Secretary of State who is very much committed uh, in every sense to ensuring that Ukraine has everything it needs. On that line, is there any further support that the Secretary of State can and will make available to ensure uh, that the damages uh, left by the drone attacks designed to disrupt power and water supplies are repaired urgently? Uh, it may not necessarily be an MOD thing, but it is a, a repair of it and then to ensure that they are not attacked again. And can he make that happen with any manpower, expertise, and supplies to thwart the determination of Putin to leave Ukrainians in the dark and with no water? Well, the uh, positive side is that the Ukrainians are incredibly skilled at, at being able to fix and repair and build uh, uh, their, their equipment, and in many cases, they've managed to turn around the shortages of electricity in the matter of days, and Putin has not been successful. Uh, on other wider skills, I offered at some stage uh, sending uh, raw electrical and mechanical engineers not into Ukraine but in neighbouring countries to assist with the refurbishment of tanks and things like that. That is some of the skills we can do. In my experience, mechanics, mechanics, mechanic. They'll fix a, a Challenger tank as quickly as they'll fix a T-72. So uh, uh, those are always on offer. If the Ukrainians ask, we will be happy to help. Margaret Ferrier. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I agree with members across the chamber in praising the right honourable gentleman in his handling of the Ukraine-Russia situation. After NATO General Secretary said NATO allies will act if Sweden or Finland come under pressure from Russia or another adversary before they become full members of the alliance, how does the Defence Secretary predict this might antagonise Putin, and what risks does he assess there to be for the UK? I think if Putin attacks Sweden and Finland, they'll antagonise Sweden and Finland. I don't think they'll antagonise themselves. If, if Russia chooses to lash out on Sweden and Finland, not only would NATO uh, obviously meet and discuss what it can do to protect one of its closest allies, who are 
choosing to join, the United Kingdom has a number of security arrangements that we have recently made with both Sweden and Finland, and we would ensure, even bilaterally, we would step up to the plate. Uh, I think what we can see, however, is uh, that because of Russia's uh, very poor and failing invasion of Ukraine, uh, its conventional military forces that it would have had previously near there are hollowed out or, in fact, uh, destroyed. They have much less uh, to threaten those countries. But things around crit critical national infrastructure, pipelines, electricity cables are things we are absolutely alert for, which is why I recently deployed uh, 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 two ships uh, into the area. I think it's HMS, I better check the name, uh, uh, HMS Enterprise, I think, if that's my uh, thing, uh, and uh, Attack 23 Frigate to make sure we help protect Norway's uh, uh, pipelines and indeed our infrastructure. I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for Defence uh, for his statement today and updating the House on events uh, relating to the war in Ukraine. Go on, then. <laughs> We're now moving on to the business statement. I call the Leader of the House, Penny Morton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The business for the week commencing the 24th of October will include Monday the 24th of October, consideration of an out-of-turn supplementary estimates relating to Her Majesty's Treasury and the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, followed by proceedings on the Supply and Appropriation Adjustments Bill, followed by consideration of a resolution relating to stamp duty land tax reduction, followed by second reading of the Stamp Duty Land Tax Reduction Bill. Tuesday, the 25th of October, second reading of the EU Retained Law Revocation and Reform Bill. Wednesday, the 26th of October, Committee of the Whole House and remaining stages of the Identity and Language Northern Ireland Bill Lords. Thursday, the 27th of October, a debate on a motion on the National Food Strategy and Food Security followed by a general debate on guaranteeing the right to maintain contact in care settings. These subjects uh, were determined by the Backbench Business Committee. Friday, the 28th of October, private members' bills. The provisional business for the week commencing the 31st of October includes Monday, the 31st of October, which is scheduled to be the day of the Chancellor's statement. Remaining stages of the Genetic Technology Precision Breeding Bill, followed by consideration of Lord's Amendments to the Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Bill. Tuesday, the 1st of November, remaining stages of the Online Safety Bill. Wednesday, the 2nd of November, Opposition Day debate on a motion in the name of the Scottish National Party, subject to be announced. Thursday, the 3rd of November, business to be determined by the Backbench Business Committee, and Friday, the 4th of November, the House will not be sitting. That's Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the House for the forthcoming business. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, where on earth do I start? <laughs> where? I mean, do we even still have a Prime Minister? This is the morning... Well, Bit, now it's the afternoon after the morning after the night before, with the government seemingly falling to pieces before our very eyes. As some of their own backbenchers said yesterday, they ought to be ashamed of themselves. With a Home Secretary resigning amidst discussions of national security, a government seemingly unable to, even to organise against our motion to ban fracking, forced early morning hours clarifications from Downing Street all in a day's work for this absolute disgrace of a government party who are simply unfit to govern. They are dragging this country's reputation through the mud and the British people will never forgive them for it. British people are looking to the government for answers on how they're going to pay for their mortgage or their rent or their bills, which the government have sent sky high when they crashed the economy. Instead, chaos. Mr Deputy Speaker, Parliament ought to be a model workplace, so could the Leader confirm that reports of bad behaviour in the lobbies last night or outside the lobby will be investigated? Could she please put on record that, in her view, there is no place for intimidation and bullying on the parliamentary estate? 
And on the actual votes themselves, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's come to my attention there is a discrepancy between the number of votes recorded in the no lobby, which were read out in the chamber, and the numbers later published on the voting lists. So is the leader aware of any of her party's members who perhaps didn't want to vote against our motion, but to avoid controversy with their whips, marched through the lobby but didn't scan their pass, and therefore avoid publication of their names? Could she also clarify whether yesterday's vote was a confidence vote? or not. Downing Street said it was. Then a number 10 special adviser said, told the climate minister to say that it wasn't, which he duly did from this dispatch box, causing confusion on his own side. And at half past one this morning, number 10 suggested, in fact, that it was. And then the transport secretary told Kay Burley a few hours ago that it wasn't. We know the prime minister is infamous for her U-turns. This is beyond a joke. If it was a vote of confidence, when will the Prime Minister be removing the whip from her rebels? I also notice that the Government has pulled our next opposition day. I can't think why, after yesterday, that they might do that. Are they punishing us for their chaos and their incompetence last night? Is the Leader aware of Standing Order 14, which allocates 17 days to the Leader of the Official Opposition Party? They are falling behind, so will the government be giving us an, an opposition day on the week commencing the 7th of November? Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm glad the leader actually has some business to announce, given their complete inability to function. As well as chaos, we've got a raft of dropped legislation, broken promises, unmet manifesto commitments, and she can't blame the British people for asking, what is the point of this government? Don't just take it from me. The former Home Secretary mentioned the very thing in her letter, She's raising concerns about the government breaking key pledges to voters, failing to honour their manifesto commitments. Someone had their Weetabix, or was it tofu, for breakfast yesterday? Perhaps the leader could provide some clarity on what further broken promises she's referring to. Can I also ask that the government sends ministers to answer urgent questions who can actually provide answers. Many important questions on national security went unanswered this morning in the urgent question relating to the sacking of the Home Secretary. Sorry, resignation, was it? Mr Deputy Speaker, out of touch, out of ideas, unable to govern, too busy trying to get through an hour by hour, minute by minute, worsening Tory psychodrama, rather than focusing, I see it's happening in front of my very eyes, on the serious issues facing all our constituents, not just mine, theirs as well. They've crashed the economy, they've left working people to pick up the bill, and now they're falling apart. This is a Tory crisis made in Downing Street. They're letting everyone down. The Prime Minister has clearly lost the confidence of her party, and her party's lost the confidence of the country. It is time for a general election so that a Labour government can deliver a fresh start for the British people. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, start by thanking the Speaker for his statement at the start of business, which I do wholeheartedly endorse. Uh, we have ways of organising ourselves in a party system in this place, but ultimately we are all individuals making judgments about what is in the best interests of the country and our constituents. And sometimes votes are about more than the issue that has been debated. Last night's Labour motion was an attempt to seize control of proceedings, and we all know that that was uh, deliberately done to enable campaigns today uh, about members' views on fracking and uh, to spark the usual social media outrage, and I know that Twitter has taken down uh, some accounts uh, today. This is standard operating procedure by Labour, and uh, many members on this side of the House have worked hard to ensure that fracking is rightly not imposed on their community, and it is by their efforts that fracking is not in their community, and it is the government's policy that to allow fracking where there is consent. And if we want to take the temperature down in this place, I suggest we take the temperature uh, down outside of this place too. I'm happy to go on record to say uh, that I uh, am against bullying both in Parliament and outside it too, and I hope that is the, uh, the view of all members of this House. Um, the country does need stability and it needs calm. 
And I'm glad to say that is the effect that the Chancellor is having. Market functioning has improved, borrowing costs have been lowered, and the pound is strengthening. But there is more to do. Despite the very volatile global economic conditions, the economy remains resilient. Unemployment is at its lowest level for nearly 50 years, and the UK is forecast to have the fastest growth in the G7 this year. Elsewhere, good work is going on in government too, in contrast to the picture painted by the Honourable Lady opposite. Just this week, the Lord Chancellor has opened up the legal aid system to make it easier for victims of domestic abuse to get access to free legal aid and representation. We've had huge wins in the Department for Trade, 100 million trade win for the drinks industry and huge infrastructure project wins. We've announced nearly 800 million to support research centres with breakthrough new treatments, 180 million to support children's development in their early years. DWP has launched a new service which helps businesses support members of their workforce who have a disability or become sick. Earlier this week, we passed the Energy Prices Bill, removing the worry for households and businesses of their energy costs. And we are introducing the Transport Strikes Bill, providing protection for the travelling public who rely on rail services to get to work or go about their daily lives. I hope that the Labour Party will back us and the fed up commuters to protect those services. Um, Honourable members opposite have been running around saying in office but not in power all this week. And I think that's probably a more accurate description of Labour's relationship with their trade union paymasters. We are getting on with the job, and business, further business will be announced in the usual way. And representing the chair of the Backbench Business Committee, Bob Blackman. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The, the chairman of the Backbench Business Committee, the Honourable Member for Gateshead, is indisposed, so he's asked me to report back. In addition to the business that my right hon. Friend has announced, uh, on Tuesday morning there will be a debate in Westminster Hall on baby loss and safe uh, staffing in maternity care. And in Westminster Hall next Thursday, there will be debates on Colleges Week and World Menopause Day, both subjects of which I think, all subjects of which I think colleagues will wish you to debate. And on Tuesday, the 1st of November, uh, provided the uh, Madam Deputy Speaker agrees, there will be uh, a debate on the importance of religious education in modern Britain. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a queue of debates requiring chamber time, so I'm very grateful to my right hon. Friend for announcing further uh, dates for the Backbench Business Committee, but can I also say uh, that we are short of debates that will go into Westminster Hall on Thursdays. So if colleagues wish to get a debate from us, uh, I would encourage them to apply for Westminster Hall debates. Uh, now, Mr Deputy Speaker, on Monday it's Diwali. Hindus, Sikhs and Jains will be celebrating Diwali in the time-honoured fashion. So can I call on my right hand friend to join with me in wishing everyone Shubh Diwali and Nuton Vashna Abhinandan for Wednesday and the Hindu New Year. Well, I do. I, I'm very happy to join with my, uh, my honourable friend uh, in wishing everyone happy Diwali and thank him for the update uh, that he has given to this House on uh, backbench business uh, and stressing the importance of uh, getting those debates. The topics, uh, the issues that colleagues have put forward uh, show that this is a, a, a much helpful innovation uh, and I would urge colleagues to apply for those debates. Deidre Bob. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I too wish everyone a very happy Diwali for when it comes. Um, it's good to see the leader still in her place, Mr Deputy Speaker, but perhaps this is our last exchange, for who knows who next will be asked to close their eyes, think of Britain and become the next Prime Minister. Given the jacket of the current incumbent is clearly on a sugarloo peg, I think she should go for it. The 1922 committee chair has entered number 10 reportedly just now. So, if it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. <laughs> or it may be that after the latest developments in the government's implosion, including a resignation from a great office of state, still the former secretary, uh, Home Secretary fulfills that dream of making the front page of the Telegraph. Eh? 
uh, that the Leaders' Party is running out of candidates for the job and she'll simply assume it. Assuming, that is, she still wants to inherit this Icarus economy, so spectacularly burned and crashed by the government, leading to IMF and Bank of England interventions, as if the UK was a rudderless economy with no one at the wheel. Which, come to think of it, does seem to be the course Britain is set on now, Mr yeah. Deputy Speaker, with all of us having been treated as economic laboratory mice trapped within the deluded constructs of libertarian think tanks. A debate on some sort of compulsory training for government ministers on the basics of economics might be helpful. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, many of us in here and outside this place are finding it a bit of a struggle to keep up with events. So, can we have a statement, please, on exactly who the current members of the government are just now? <laughs> and I believe the government's bringing in legislation today, mounting further attacks on trade unions and introducing a minimal level of service guarantee for the rail network. Surely it's time we brought in a minimum level of service guarantee for Westminster governments. <laughs> And while we're at it, a debate on molestation, reflections and intimidations, as outlined in Erskine May, might prove useful. In the 18th century, as I'm sure the Bayes Secretary knows only too well, insulting or menacing members or trying by force to influence them in their conduct in Parliament was roundly condemned and considered a contempt. The time is clearly ripe for refresher courses. Look, Mr Speaker. Look, Mr Deputy Speaker, the, de the temptation is always to have a bit of fun with these weekly jousts over the uh, political soap opera, but there is in fact very little room for amusement this week. I am all too conscious of the millions of people who are still looking to this place to provide them with some reassurance those in charge have a clear idea of the problems they face and know what to do to sort them. All four nations are looking on aghast at the shambles this government has created for itself, but far more seriously for all of our citizens. The attractions of an independent Scotland, free of this burrough of a place, yeah. grow yeah. ever yeah. greater. Yeah. General yeah. election now. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm actually quite cheered by the, what the Honourable Lady says, because I, I'd always thought the expression was, close your eyes and think of England. <laughs> Given that she asked us to close our eyes and think of Britain, I think I'm starting to make some progress with the, uh, with the Honourable Lady. Um, I'm sorry that she, uh, that she didn't mention uh, any of the, uh, the economic support uh, that uh, we have put through uh, this House this week uh, to the citizens in, uh, in Scotland, but I have to tell her, as we prepare for a, a statement on the 31st of October, there is a policy being touted that I'm afraid to say would cost every single person in Scotland £2,184. I, I don't know what the Honourable, Right Honourable Lady's views would be on that matter, whether she would be for or against a policy that would take £2,184 off every individual in Scotland. The Honourable Lady looks confused. Let me help her out. She is for such a policy because that is the price of her divided policies. So Roger Gay. Roger. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, one of the finer legacies of the last administration and of the 2019 Conservative Election Manifesto was our commitment to animal welfare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would my right honourable friend confirm that that commitment is still firmly in place, and would she therefore find time as swiftly as possible to bring forward the remaining stages of the Kept Animals Bill? Well, I thank my uh, right honourable friend for uh, reminding us of the uh, track record we have in this area. As an independent nation, we are now able to go further than ever on animal welfare. We have banned the live export of animals for fattening and slaughter. We have legislated for animal sentience, uh, and we are building an, an animal welfare into our uh, independent uh, trade policy. Uh, other business will be announced in the usual way, but the honourable gentleman has those assurances, and he should be confident, confident when he looks at our track record. Chris Bryant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to ask about brain injury because yesterday morning I hosted a round table here um, with lots of people who have been engaged in the issue around concussion in sports. She may have seen recent stories about rugby players, football players who um, are suffering from depression, anxiety, a whole series of different um, me mental health complaints and many are, have suicidal or um, dementia problems um, resulting from 
sub-concussive events, so not even when they've been knocked out, but repeated shaking or, or blows, minor blows to the head. Can we have a debate on what the government's going to do about this, when we're going to have proper protocols for all sports so that we protect every single child, especially as their brain is developing? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for raising that. I will certainly raise this with uh, both the Department for Health and also the Department for uh, Education as well. But he will know uh, how to apply for a debate. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Currently, organisations like the government-funded Energy Savings Trust are providing excellent advice to households up and down the country <coughs> on how to save energy and also then save money on their bills. I think it's time that we also did similar advice for businesses. And I am working with uh, business leaders throughout the two cities, including Kate Nichols of UK Hospitality and Kate Hart from Central London Business Improvement Districts on this matter. Would my right honourable friend join me in encouraging businesses across the country to take steps to be more energy efficient and does she agree with me that perhaps we should be looking at the House of Commons on its energy consumption mm -hmm. too? Well, I thank uh, the Honourable Lady for her excellent question, which I shall make sure that uh, the Secretary of State hears. Uh, and to thank her, the, the campaign she describes, I think, would be extremely useful uh, to many businesses. Quite often, small differences in behaviour can lead to massive savings in, uh, in energy, but also uh, business costs as well. Anna McMurrin. Thank you. What I witnessed yesterday in the entrance to the voting lobby was an absolute disgrace. A clearly visibly distressed Tory MP being forced against his will and bullied, manhandled into the voting chamber. So I know this government is disintegrating in front of our very eyes, but this is a challenge to democracy. Will the Leader of the House make an urgent statement against this sort of bullying and support the, the investigation that is now clearly needing to take place? Well, I would refer the Honourable Lady to what I said at the start of my remarks today. The Speaker made a statement which uh, he, uh, I completely support what he said. We, of course, everyone in this chamber would condemn uh, bullying, both, I hope, uh, outside of this chamber, uh, but also uh, within it too. But what I would say to the Honourable Lady is the situation is not helped if people don't make specific allegations. Any member of this House who has seen bad conduct or who has been the victim of bad conduct must be able to come forward and report that and it be investigated. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, such uh, substantiated uh, allegations at all. And I'm afraid I would say to the Honourable Lady, if she wants to help the situation, think about what she could do to assist that situation. And I would uh, ask her to check that against her behaviour today. Well, I know. find time in this chamber for a debate about the modernisation of the land registry. Currently, if an identity thief steals your identity and uses it to transfer the title of your house, there is a very protracted, long-winded mechanism that ends up in a tribunal which may well at the end of it not see your house return to you. This has happened to one of my constituents. He has lost a home that he spent many months investing in, in time, in cash, and indeed in his own hard labour renovating it, only to let it to tenants who stole his identity and then used it to transfer the title. He is struggling to get that property back, and it strikes me that the land registry procedures, where it's simply impossible to transfer a title back, are outdated and very much in need of updating. Well, I have to say, I've I've heard uh, about the case that the, uh, the Right Honourable Lady is, uh, it, it has been uh, working on, on behalf of her constituents. It's absolutely appalling. Um, to be, be robbed of any uh, property is, uh, is bad enough, but one's home, which you have been put your heart and soul into, you may have brought up a family there, it's, it's really incredibly uh, distressing. I know that the, uh, my uh, Right Honourable Friend has been doing a huge amount to put a rocket up 
the, uh, the land registry. I want to assist her in doing that, and I will uh, write to the Secretary of State, but she also will know there are questions on Tuesday, and she should raise that there. Uh, Christine Jardine. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I have raised concerns recently with the Home Office and the Ministry of Defence about a 13-year-old um, girl living in my constituency, separated from her family in Afghanistan, despite assurances that they were given at the time when they assisted the forces in Afghanistan. So I wonder if um, the leader could um, advise me on how I might go about dis raising this with the minister directly and whether we could have some time in the chamber to debate the ARAP scheme and its progress. Well, I'm very sorry to hear about that case. The, the Honourable Lady will know how she can apply for a, a debate, and she may wish to work with other colleagues to do that. Um, but if she passes the details of that case uh, to my office, I will write on her behalf and ask for a meeting uh, with the Minister. If you want to... David Mundell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, my right honourable friend may have heard many uh, of the tributes which were paid to the late Dame Angela Ransbury, uh, who sadly passed away uh, last week. Most of those tributes focused on her acting and singing prowess and, of course, uh, her legendary character, Jessica Fletcher, in Murder, She Wrote. But is my right honourable friend aware uh, that Angela Lansbury was one of the first champions of the fight against AIDS, and particularly in the 1980s, when many celebrities shied away uh, from the issue? She was in the vanguard of fundraising, and she famously said, we will never give up on the fight until the fight is won. But does my right honourable friend accept that that fight will not be won unless the United Kingdom and others come forward to replenish the global fund to fight AIDS, because that is the only way in which we are going to achieve Dame Angela's objective? Well, I thank uh, my right honourable friend for and join with him in the tribute that he uh, pays to uh, the late Angela Lansbury. I did know that about her. She was a, a stalwart and, a, and someone that really uh, changed uh, views towards uh, that uh, particular uh, disease. I can tell him that the government has restated its commitment uh, to the Global Fund, and we will make an announcement on our pledge in the coming weeks. Uh, Stephen Doughty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Deputy Speaker. The problem uh, with the chaos in the government is that, of course, it, it delays getting answers to real-world problems that our constituents are facing. And one of those that my constituents in uh, the Hayes Point apartments in Sully have been struggling to get an answer on is when they will get payments from the Energy Bills Support Scheme. Uh, because they uh, come under what's called the Alternative Fund, which is for those who don't have a direct relationship with an electricity supplier. I've been trying to get answers from the business department on this. They haven't had their money, like others have up and down the country. Could she urgently chase an answer in a statement from the Secretary of State for Business Energy um, on this, so that they know when they're going to get their support with their energy bills? Thank you. Well, this, uh, this support is uh, enormous and it is most welcome, but people need to know how the schemes work, and I know the Honourable Gentleman appreciates that they are, they are complex schemes. I will certainly follow this up uh, with the department and ensure that members are given information that uh, is uh, easily uh, understandable for their constituents. Uh, Anna Fogg. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, look, this weekend, Southend came together to commemorate my successor, Sir David Amis. So, with that in mind, uh, would my right honourable friend agree to a debate on the transformative effect of music on those with learning difficulties and disabilities. In Southend, we have not only the Love to Sign Choir, but the International Music Man Project, recording its first ever si single today with the uh, Royal Marines brand. Will my right honourable friend and the whole house help make this the Christmas number one for, for all that it does to help those with learning difficulties uh, overcome barriers and to the benefit of us all and overcome huge challenges in their life? Yeah. Well, I thank my honourable friend for raising it, this and uh, paying tribute to our uh, dearly missed uh, late uh, colleague, Sir David Amos. The Music Man Project is an incredible uh, organisation. The Christmas single that she mentions will, uh, is available now to download. Their first live performance is tonight at the Painted Hall in Greenwich, accompanied by the uh, Royal Marines uh, Band, and uh, I have to say I was very privileged to go to their first rehearsal, 
and it was uh, one of the most uh, amazing experiences I, I, I've had. Uh, I have a video of the effect of these two organisations coming together, and it is a, an amazing thing and uh, the lasting legacy of our late colleague. Here, here. Barry uh, Sheeran. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I know that the Leader of the House is new to the role, and I know she has a great com combative style, but I hope she'll reflect on what she said to uh, my honourable friend, the member for Cardiff North, because I think she was very unfair in her response. But um, on, on bus forthcoming business, she knows that all of us will be very busy as members of Parliament, as I am in Huddersfield, working with a whole network of charities, local people, local organisations, because it's going to be a long, hard winter for so many people who are not going to be able to afford to, to heat the house, not able to feed the family, and support groups are, have to, will, will have to be organised. Could she make sure that we get the right ministers here, DCLG or whichever, to talk about how the government can help us with the resources to net, you know, build that network and resources so that we can provide that food, provi provide those warm spaces, and you know, so MPs could actually roll up their sleeves and help? Um, well, on that, uh, on that latter point, um, I can certainly raise this with the uh, key departments involved. So much of this is about sharing good practice. There will be organisations that will be working across uh, several uh, areas around the country, uh, and picking up good practice and sharing it is incredibly important. Justin Tomlinson. Drama, suspense, who done it? No, Mr Speaker, not here, but in cinemas up and down the country. Uh, great entertainment, key part of our social fabric, and uh, for the whips, an opportunity for people to be somewhere where they can turn their phones off. <laughs> Will the uh, Leader of the House find time to debate the importance of the ex exclusivity window for new films in this changing entertainment landscape? <laughs> Well, I thank uh, my uh, honourable friend for his, uh, his very witty question. I shall certainly raise this with the relevant department. George Hart. The Leader of the House um, will be aware that one of the important principles of our constitutional arrangements is the principle of the mandate. Mm. Given that the government's mandate derived from the uh, last um, general election manifesto has now either been abandoned or exhausted, isn't it really time that we had a general election? Yeah, yeah. When uh, it would have been in this country's interest to have a general election, when this parliament was in paralysis due to Brexit before the, uh, the 2019 general election, um, the Honourable Gentleman's Party blocked it. So I'm not going to take any uh, uh, lessons uh, to him on, on that front. Uh, we stood on a manifesto uh, that we are delivering, uh, but that work is not yet done, and we will continue to deliver the manifesto that gave us this sizeable majority. Speaker, grassroots clubs and sports are vital to communities like mine in Hyndburn and Hasland, and I've got some fantastic clubs like Huncourt United and the Wildcats, but they do need support to make sure that they've got the vital screen spaces that they need to train, but also the funding to exist. So could we allow a debate in government time on how we continue to support grassroots clubs and sports? Well, I thank my honourable friend for, for raising this important uh, issue. I shall certainly uh, flag what she has said today with the relevant department. She will know how to apply to a debate, and I think it will be a very well attended one if she secures it. Uh, Jeff Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, pavement parking is a massive problem in South Manchester. It's a difficult problem to solve. Uh, we need the power that London has to introduce a default ban. Now, last week, the Secretary of State, who happily has just joined the front bench, uh, 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 said it was a priority for her. Uh, and would bring the forward the legislation we need as soon as parliamentary time allows. So can I ask the leader to work with her colleague to make that happen? I think it would be a relatively simple thing to do and would be widely welcomed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, to save uh, my um, civil servants some work uh, and some paper, uh, I shall put it on record uh, to Hansard that I will ensure that the uh, relevant Secretary of State uh, hears what the Honourable Gentleman has raised. John Lamont. Um, Nicola Sturgeon confirmed this week she's pushing for a hard border between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. 
The SNP's new economic policies would cost businesses a fortune and recklessly risk people's jobs. So does the Leader of the House agree we should have a debate on this issue so the SNP can finally tell the people of Scotland the truth about the enormous economic damage that Nicola Sturgeon's plan for a hard border would do to Scotland? Well, I thank my honourable friend. Yes, I'm afraid this is the latest wheeze from the SNP to risk jobs and burn taxpayers' money. Uh, let us not forget, this is the party that, during the pandemic, hired a testing firm at the cost of £10 million uh, that promptly furloughed all of its staff. In fairness to them, they did try and guarantee uh, some jobs. They paid a company um, the tune of uh, £5 million pounds per job and then failed to secure any of those jobs. Audit Scotland said of the, of the Scottish Government it had no framework to deal with the private sector. And of course, the most spectacular uh, is the fact that they have paid the cost of 24 ferries for just two vessels. Peter Hophouse. Mr Deputy Speaker, MPs should be allowed to vote according to their judgment and without being harassed or bullied. Can she clarify what happened in the low, no lobby according to her observations? And does she agree with me that yesterday's event throws a very bad light on the professionalism of this our parliament? Well, can I say that I agree with the Honourable Lady, and as I set out in my earlier remarks. Uh, we have a way of organising ourselves in this place, but we are elected by our constituents to look after their interests and the interests of uh, this country. I have to say that I was in the lobby last night. I did not see uh, any of that that has been reported, but there are processes for reporting these things and for looking at them. And I'm sure if you will uh, have heard Mr Speaker's statement earlier today, I think he is right. That is the right approach. Celine Saxby. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Nitrous oxide capsules have littered North Devon beaches this summer as more and more people are using them for recreational purposes, despite the risks such as damage to the lungs, halting breathing and slowing the heart to a dangerous level. Manufacturers this week have called for further restrictions on its purchase. Can I ask if the government may consider this recommendation and restrict sales for recreational use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I thank my honourable friend for shining a spotlight on this important issue and clearly a, a, an issue of uh, great concern to her constituents? Uh, given concerns uh, about the, the use of nitrous oxide, particularly by young people, the former former Home Secretary uh, sought advice from the Independent Advisory Council on the misuse of drugs and when they respond the, the government is, will consider their advice carefully and inform the House. There's a huge problem across my constituency of youths razzing around the streets on motorbikes, sometimes stolen, riding without helmets, pulling stunts, putting uh, other road users and pedestrians in danger. I uh, was accompanied by Councillor Alison Gwynne to a meeting with Chief Superintendent Davis on Friday. Uh, the Denton South Councillors Reed, Newton and Naylor had a packed public meeting on Monday about this and Audenshaw Councillors Smith and Martin are still picking up the consequences of a 16-year-old boy coming off his bike and sadly losing his life. This is serious. It comes down to a very resource-intensive uh, programme to tackle it. Can we have a statement from the new Home Secretary that this government takes these issues seriously and will give Greater Manchester Police and other police forces the tools that they need to tackle this scourge on our streets? Well, I'm very sorry to hear about that situation and particularly that, that tragic uh, loss of life. Um, the Honourable Gentleman is right. Um, it, it's a whole community approach to this. I will certainly make sure what he has said today is flagged with the Home Secretary. Because. Deputy Speaker. I welcome the Chancellor of the Exchequer's <coughs> statement earlier this week, which set out a realistic approach to dealing with our financial challenges. But uh, he, the, my honourable, right honourable friend will be aware that that causes concerns about funding for a whole range of schemes. My two local authorities are very concerned about uh, the, their levelling up bids. Can, can the Leader of the House give an assurance that when the Chancellor makes his statement uh, on the 31st, it will be accompanied by uh, clarification as to uh, uh, existing projects? 
Well, I thank uh, my honourable friend for, for raising this. I know the huge amount of work he has done on the levelling up agenda in his constituency. I will certainly make sure the Chancellor has heard what he has said today, and I will also make sure uh, that the Secretary of State for levelling up has heard his words too. And Oswald. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is estimated that between 2.5 and 4 per cent of people, adults and children, have ADHD. Neurodiversity matters, and all of us benefit the more that that is realised and understood. So I wonder if the Leader of the House would agree to a debate in government time on the importance of fostering greater knowledge and awareness and understanding of neurodiverse conditions, and thank the groups working hard to provide support and information especially during October, which is ADHD Awareness Month. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for, for raising this important point, and I do join with her in thanking the large number of organisations who do work to ensure that families have the advice and support uh, that they need. I shall certainly flag this uh, with uh, the uh, number of departments that will be uh, uh, looking at this, this particular uh, issue, and I would encourage her as well to raise it in questions. Bob Seeley. Speaker, I welcome very much the minimum service levels which are going to be outlined in upcoming legislation. Can, can the Leader of the House um, please tell me if she would support, as part of that, minimum service levels on lifeline services such as the Solent Ferries, where we have both the RMT and Unite. Would, uh, I heard approval uh, noises coming from my, uh, my colleague on the front bench with me, but I would also point him to uh, this government's record uh, during the pandemic. And uh, we very much saw those uh, particular services as, as needing support, uh, and, uh, and we uh, followed that up with, with action. But I thank him for his very helpful suggestion, which has gone down well uh, with my colleague. Paul Blomfield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sunshine Preschool, which serves families on some of the lowest incomes in my constituency, is facing closure. Several other constituents have written to me as their children have had their nursery places withdrawn due to staff shortages and funding problems, and clearly this is a national problem. Mm. It's not a question, as the government seems to think, of ratios of staff to children, but the failure of funded early learning rates to keep up with costs. So can we have a debate on the crisis in childcare to urge ministers to bring forward proper support for this vital social provision, which is so important not only to parents, but to supporting economic growth? <laughs> Well, uh, the Honourable Gentleman is, is absolutely right. These are incredibly important services for uh, the children themselves and uh, their uh, development uh, and also to support families, but they are absolutely critical to enable uh, people to remain uh, in work uh, and to progress uh, through work. I shall certainly uh, raise this issue. I know it is a matter that is a concern uh, across the House uh, with uh, the Department for Education, and I also know that uh, uh, the work the government has been doing on early years to take a, a more holistic approach to all of this and make sure it's doing what parents really need it uh, to do uh, will also, the, the uh, colleagues involved in that will also want to hear the Honourable Gentleman's remarks. Andy Carter. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I join with my Honourable Friend, the Member for Harrow, uh, in wishing uh, all members of uh, the Hindu community in Warrington South a very happy Diwali? I recently met with many members of that community who expressed concerns about recent events in the, in the Midlands. Can the leader assure my constituents that the safety of all communities is a priority for this government and they should enjoy in their community the Festival of Light? Well, I thank uh, my honourable friend for, for raising this. I do join uh, with the remarks uh, that he made, uh, and uh, I, uh, especially uh, to all those in his constituency. Clive Bafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituents are really concerned about uh, cuts to their train services that have been allowed under powers that were introduced during COVID. The Secretary of State has allowed South Eastern Trains to make major alterations to its timetable using those powers, even though we are out of COVID now. So can we have a statement from the Secretary of State to explain why these powers have been allowed to be abused in this way and why my constituents are losing train services? 
Uh, well, I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for his remarks. Uh, my honourable, right honourable friend, will have, have heard them, but I will formally follow up uh, with the department. Benjamin O'Hara. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to draw the Leader of the House attention, indeed the whole House attention, to early day motion 480, which was published this morning. It congratulates Darun Grammar School, which yesterday was awarded the 2022 World's Best School Prize in the Community Collaboration category. I hope to arrange a visit to this Parliament very soon from the school. But before that, would the Leader join me in sending her congratulations to Head Teacher David Mitchell, his staff, and all the pupils of Darun Grammar School on this remarkable achievement, which you can imagine is a source of huge pride for the town, indeed everyone in Argyll and Butte, and is a real triumph for Scottish education. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I am um, going to enter into the spirit of his uh, question and not uh, comment in depth about the SNP's uh, uh, track record in education. But what a wonderful achievement, and I do send my congratulations to, uh, to David Mitchell, uh, all his staff and pupils, and uh, I hope they will celebrate. Patrick Grady. Given the Prime Minister's announcement that she intends to stand down, I wonder how wise it is to proceed with much of the business that the Leader of the House has uh, announced for next week, not least the retained European law revocation and reform bill. It is of massive constitutional significance. It would enact a huge power grab from both this place and the devolved administrations. Given that the bill that created retained EU law, the European Withdrawal Act, was subject to eight days of scrutiny on the floor of this House in Committee of the whole House, can, if she is able to make any kind of guarantee whatsoever about the future of the government, given the complete chaos that is now engulfing uh, the, the Conservative Party, will that bill be subject to scrutiny by a committee of the whole House and not just by a public bill committee? Very important bill which will modernise the, the statute book. And I would say to uh, the honourable gentleman, with regard to other matters, uh, I am going to keep calm and carry on, and I would suggest everyone else do the same. Yeah, yeah. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I take this opportunity to wish all of my constituents uh, getting ready to celebrate uh, next week a very happy uh, Diwali. Can I ask the Leader of the House? Um, she may or may not be aware that there's been a steep decline since 2015 in the number of UK students studying Gujarati, Urdu uh, and other languages prevalent across South Asia at GCSE uh, level. Given the significance of these languages for many British uh, children's educational <coughs> attainment and crucially for our ability to maximise our trade and security relationships with India and other countries uh, in South Asia, could we have a debate in government time to explore the reasons for that decline and indeed how we might reverse it? Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for raising uh, that issue, and I will certainly uh, make sure that the Department for Education has heard uh, what he has said today. He will know very well how to secure a debate, uh, and I thank him for raising the points. Yeah. Yeah. Fellows. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, I wish I could take the Leader of the advice, uh, House's advice to keep calm and carry on, but in my role as SNP spokesperson on disabilities, I meet regularly with disabled organisations. Uh, organisations representing disabled people. This week in Parliament, muscular dystrophy had a drop-in to which my young parliamentary assistant went, and he came back visibly shocked at the amount of electricity that one young person needed to use to stay alive. With the U-turn by the Chancellor and me, and with the news we have just received that the uh, leader of the Conservative Party has just stood down. Will there be a statement on the 31st of October? I know it's not in the uh, leader's gift to tell me exactly, but if there is to be a statement by another chancellor or the same one, I, I don't really care which, can we have some kind of guarantee that there will be extra help for people like this? Because it's absolutely imperative. It's life and death to people and it's life and death to their carers as well. Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for raising this because it affords me an opportunity to uh, provide reassurance to, to people. This was it raised last week uh, as well, and I uh, have already written to uh, the Department for Health and other departments on, uh, uh, on this matter. Uh, we want to uh, ensure that people are looked after and taken care of and supported uh, throughout this winter. We're very aware of the additional costs uh, that people with certain health conditions and disabilities are facing. 
I know this issue is being looked at, and I also want to assure her that I understand people want reassurance fast. Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Conscious I'm in the Honourable Member for Strangford's slot, and although I may wish to ask the Leader of the House if she wants to make any statement of intent in relation to her future candidacy for Leader of her party, I do want to focus on comments made by the Honourable Member for Dumfrieshire, Clydesdale and Tweeddale in relation to the Global Replenishment Fund. When the Government failed to make an announcement on the 21st of September of a pledge, that was really unusual. And now that we're hearing plans of the government to drop ODA spending even further, I do think we are really stepping back from our global commitments. So, can the Leader of the House tell us when that announcement is likely to be made? Is there going to be positive news for the Global Replenishment Fund? And will there be time made for the House to scrutinise it? Well, at the pledging conference where we, we did not uh, um, make a, a, uh, a, a detailed pledge, uh, we did put on record very strongly our commitment to that. I think the issue was that uh, a minister was not available to go, and so the pledge uh, wasn't made. That was, uh, from memory, my, my understanding. But I would say to the Honourable Lady, this is expected very shortly, uh, and I would point her to our record, uh, which is world-leading uh, on this uh, and other uh, replenishment conferences. I'd like to thank the Leader of the House uh, for making her statement uh, and uh, responding to many questions. Points of order, Anna McMurrin. Thank you. Uh, the Leader of the House just called into question my behaviour when I raised the very serious allegations that I witnessed a bullying and manhandling mm. in the voting lobby I last night. Yeah. I don't think that this is appropriate. Can the Deputy Speaker assure me that there is an improper and full investigation into this very serious matter. And does he agree that this was an appropriate response? Yeah. It's, uh, the Speaker has already made an announcement that there is to be an investigation. But further to the point of order, Leader of the House. Um, I thank the Honourable Lady for allowing me to confirm uh, exactly uh, my views on this matter. I think it, we do ourselves a disservice in this place. If there is wrongdoing, that we don't report it and follow it up in the proper way. There, I didn't see any, but there may well have, there may well have been, and the Honourable Lady may have seen things uh, that I did not see. In that case, report, this is really important, report these issues. Uh, tell people what you have seen. Support victims to uh, come forward and do that. Do not go on the airwaves and make unsubstantiated and, in some cases, in com not the Honourable Lady, but completely uh, uh, factually incorrect allegations. That, is, that does not help raise standards in this place. I would say I think the Speaker has got this absolutely right. I would refer you to the statements he has made. And as Leader of this House, if there is any member of my party that has behaved in an, in an, in an improper way, uh, then I will condemn that. But what we need are facts, and I think the whole conduct of this House will be helpful if people stuck to the facts. James Sunderland. Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, when members enter this privileged place, we are obliged to abide by the code of conduct that exists for all of us, and which I believe to be sacrosanct. Last night, at least one photograph appeared in the national media purporting to show an alleged incident at the entrance to the No lobby. Could I please seek your counsel in two areas? First of all, how might we collectively raise the bar of personal conduct in this place so that photographs are not taken for disingenuous purposes and for political gain? Secondly, I seek your advice on how we might best identify those responsible so that this poor behaviour can be brought to account. Mr <coughs> Speaker and the entire Deputy uh, Speaker team absolutely deprecate any taking of photographs, whether they are in the voting lobbies or indeed in this chamber, and certain other areas too. Uh, he's made it absolutely clear 
And so let me just re-emphasize again, do not take photographs in areas which, uh, where they are forbidden. He's made a very good point. And of course, it's the responsibility of each and every one of us to behave uh, better as role models to those outside who are looking in. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I might. Uh, further to that point of order? I'm, I'm very grateful to the Honourable Member because he told me that he was going to raise this matter earlier, and I want to be absolutely clear that I took a photograph and I, knew, I did so knowing that I was breaking the rules of the House, uh, the etiquette of the House, certainly. Um, I did so because I believe that the example that was being set when we are to t at the moment are trying to change the culture of bullying in Parliament yes, yeah. exactly. was such that it was, it was necessary to override the normal course of... I apologise to the House for doing so. Um, I think, however, it is very important that we understand that if 12 members would stand around a member of staff in that way, yeah. yes. they would probably end up being suspended for the house, from the yeah. House for yeah. a long period of time for bullying. We've only just started taking bullying seriously in this Parliament. There is actually, I would gently suggest, I, I'm not questioning what you just said, but there is a good argument to suggest that one, that one of the rules that we've had for a very long time, that you don't take photographs and there's no photography, there's no filming indeed in the lobbies or in the adjacent areas, is now out of date. And actually, it might help us stop some of the bullying. It, I'm only suggesting it very gently, but it might actually stop some of the behaviour. Some of the behaviour changed in this house when this, ha when this chamber was filmed. Well said. One is uh, the apology, which uh, the House has heard. Uh, the second one is uh, any rule changes. Well, that's not for the Chair. That's for this House. And there is a procedure to do just that, and I'm sure uh, the Honourable Member will make his uh, views. Well, he's just made them known, but uh, at least he'll know how to progress that. And it's up to the House, then, to decide whether they wish uh, a rule change. Uh, Bob Blackman. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Irrespective of the issue that was raised by my honourable friend, we had photographers outside Parliament taking, using very expensive photography equipment, taking photos of members of Parliament, which is a breach of the security aspect of this Parliament. And I, I hope that Mr Speaker and colleagues will take action to prevent this happening in the future. I'm unaware of that, uh, Mr Blackman, but uh, he's now made that um, apparent. We do have... Um, um, I will pass him the name of the person that he should now talk to, giving the evidence that uh, he's just uh, given. Now let's, on this momentous day in British politics, move on. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> Another momentous day in British politics. Uh, we now come to the Select Committee statement. Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown, representing the Committee of Public Accounts, will speak for up to ten minutes, during which no interventions may be taken. At the conclusion of his statement, I will call members to put questions on the subject of the statement and call Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown to respond to these in turn. Can I emphasise that questions should be directed to Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown and not the relevant Government Minister? Interventions should be questions and should be brief. The front bench may now call Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Mr Deputy Speaker, while momentous events are taking place elsewhere, may I thank you and the Backbench Business Committee for the opportunity to make a statement to the House on the 18th report of this session of the Public Accounts Committee on the Government Actions to Combat Waste Crime. The PAC is an incredibly busy committee holding two major sessions a week examining the value for money of government projects, programmes and, and delivery. Our inquiries come from the extremely insightful reports created by the National Audit Office and following our PAC hearings, the committee produces a report with recommendations to the government, which constitutionally normally has two months to respond. The PAC has uh, this week published its report on the government actions to combat waste crime, highlighting our main concern with the government's strategy in combating waste crime, providing recommendations and urging the approach to be reconsidered so that waste crime is not effectively decriminalised. Despite an increase in the number of incidents of waste crime and the cost of dealing with it significantly increasing, the PAC found that DEFRA and the Environment Agency are only making, and I quote from the report, slow and piecemeal progress in implementing the 2018 resources and waste strategy, and DEFRA does not have an outline delivery plan for achieving its admirable policy of eliminating waste crime by 2043. The Government's 2018 Resources and Waste Strategy set out the admirable goal of eliminating waste crime within 25 years and listed 14 actions to be taken. 
However, only three of these actions have been completed, establishing the Joint Unit for Waste Crime, making changes to the legislation to give the agency greater powers, and giving the agency access to police intelligence systems. DEFRA must increase the speed at which it implements this strategy, and the PAC has requested that the Department provides the Committee with an outline of its plan for achieving its 2043 goal by the end of this month, a quite time, tight timetable. We all know, Madam Deputy Speaker, the thoughtlessness of waste crime, waste crime has hugely negative impact on people and the, and the area around them and the economy. Waste crime varies tremendously from area to area. However, I'm certain of all members of this House have been contacted by constituents at some point and dealt with numerous cases of fly tipping. It is antisocial, polluting and costly crime that blights the countryside and our cities and properties across England and costs the economy over a billion pounds a year, though that figure is likely to be an underestimate. The crime does not just include fly tipping, however, but illegal waste sites, breaches of waste permit conditions, breaches of exemption to the requirements for waste permits, and above all, illegal export of waste by the UK to developing countries that are ill-equipped to deal with the environment and often in def infinite uh, consequences of that waste. Waste crime is not getting the local or national attention it needs to effectively tackle it. It's a, great, it's a crime that's greatly underreported. Only around a quarter of incidents are reported. The government and agency statistics are just not accurately capturing the true scale and impact of this crime. With local authorities not providing consistent reports on fly tipping and relying on the public to report crime. The PAC asks that DEFRA and the Environment Agency explore the full range of digital solutions to solve the issue of data weaknesses, such as satellite and drone technology. The government's waste, digital waste tracking system, including new IT systems, have been described as being at the core of the government's strategy. However, it is still in development after four years. DEFRA's prototype is in the testing stages and before it reaches the next stage of development, expected to be rolled out in 2024. This will be a big step forward in improving data and improving public reporting incidents and swift and appropriate follow-up hopefully being implemented. The project has ambitious aims and DEFRA is confident it can deliver uh, having successfully carried out an IT system which was put in place when we left the EU. But the PAC has investigated similar large-scale digital projects by gov other government departments before and therefore asked DEFRA to write to the committee when the IT contract is, to, is let to confirm that it has, it has happened and what is the plan for its implementation. The landfill tax has been successful in reducing the amount of waste sent to landfills and encouraging recycling, which has become an increasingly normal way of waste disposal for many households in recent years. However, the PAC reports that this tax has increased the incentive to commit waste crimes, which, with HMRC slow to prosecute offenders. Indeed, it recently tried to prosecute an alleged offender in, in, in an Operation Nose Drive. It cost a huge 3.5 million and yet ended up without it going to court. HMT and HMRC are currently reviewing the landfill tax and they need to take into account the incentive that the current tax has in its present design in encouraging waste, time, waste crime. The tax gap, which is the difference between the tax due and tax collected, landfill tax is one of the highest as a proportion of its size for all taxes. Uh, the Chief Executive Jim Hara, the first Permanent Secretary at HMRC, assured the committee only this morning that the reason for this is that the scope has been widened to include illegal waste sites, which are difficult to track down. However, he did assure the committee that HMRC recognised the social and environmental harm caused by this. The reality is that the current system does little to deter people from committing waste crime, from organised criminals who are responsible for the majority of the incident, and they often perceive the fines, and I quote from our report, as a business expense. Fines are not high enough to, encourage, uh, to discourage the crime, and even in the unlikely case that they end up in court, the penalties are not sufficient. 
DEFRA, the Environment Agency and HMRC need to work more closely together to develop a plan for making the enforcement more effective, speeding up the process, assessing the current sentencing guidelines, which must include not only higher fines, but custodial sentences for the most egregious cases. And DEFRA must, Madam Deputy Speaker, work more closely with local authorities. And while the Department is developing the guidance, it is the local authorities who are responsible for cleaning up the waste on the land they control and investigating suspected perpetrators. Evidence from the National Farmers Union, NFU, said that better reporting and recording of waste crime on private land, and I quote, is urgently needed due to the substantial number of unrecorded incidents with fly tipping affecting two thirds of farmers. The national framework needs to be cleared by De DEFRA so that local authorities have clear guidance on tackling fly tipping and providing flexibility for response responses, but overall good practice. Finally, as I mentioned at the start, waste crime does not just include fly tipping, but it also includes the terrible practice of illegally exporting waste abroad. Exact figures are unknown, but the Environmental Services Association estimates that around 400,000 tonnes of waste are illegally exported each year, costing our economy 42 million. Waste is being exported to countries that are unable to efficiently manage the volume and toxicity of waste safely, causing substantial and sometimes permanent social and economic harm and environmental harm. The Environment Agency recently secured a record 1.5 million fine. In this instance, a waste company was prevented from sending 16 25-tonne containers from being exported to India and, ex and Indonesia. However, a further 26 containers had already been illegally exported. So finally, in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, just to go through the PAC recommendations. One, for DEFRA to increase the impetus at, with which the resources and waste strategy is taken forward, by October 22, it should provide the committee with its outline plan for achieving the elimination of waste crime by 2043 and provide annual updates on progress in this plan. Two, DEFRA and the agency need to explore the full range of potential solutions to data weaknesses, including, for example, satellite technology, and ensure the, the successful delivery of existing initiatives to improve data. Three, DEFRA should work with HMT and HMRC to ensure the current review of landfill taxes takes into account incentives that the tax currently designs, cre designs cre creates to commit waste crime. Four, DEFRA, the agency and HMRC should work with the relevant bodies within the criminal justice system to develop a plan for making enforcement more effective across the full spectrum of waste crimes. Five, DEFRA should work with local authorities to set a clear national framework for tackling fly tipping, setting an overall expectations and promoting good practice. Six, the agency should write to us within six weeks, setting out what actions would be required to enable it to understand the true scale of illegal waste exports and what further action, actions it could take to prevent them. Seventh, and lastly, DEFRA should write to the committee when the IT contract is let to confirm that it has happened and what the plan is for full implementation. Madam Deputy Speaker, waste crime is a large and costly problem that causes great angst to both those who are directly affected by waste ending up on their land, leaving them to clear it up, but also to the public who deserve to be able to enjoy a clean and healthy uh, towns and countryside. The PAC committee has clearly set out its concerns how government is con combating it. Most crucial is the lack of strategy of, or a plan for achieving its highly ambitious target of eliminating w the waste plan by 2043. Madam Deputy Speaker, this could be a huge win for the government and the people of this country. I urge DEFRA to get on with it. Kevin Jones. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I first of all thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, statement and also thank the committee for an excellent uh, Report. Can I also thank the National Audit Office for their inquiry into Operation Nosedive, which was instigated by myself and the right honourable member for uh, Holton, Price and Howden. Um, what is depressing about the report is these... ...I support, uh, but this is not a victimless crime. 
tax has been avoided, criminals have got away with, uh, with uh, these crimes, uh, and communities have been blighted. Can I urge the uh, Honourable Gentleman and his committee to make sure they keep their finger on this subject? Because our experience, myself and the Right Honourable Member for, uh, for Alton Price and Houghton, is uh, we've been at this for 10 years. Uh, the evidence is there what's going wrong. The government have just turned a blind eye and decriminalised basically waste crime. So without that pressure from his committee, can I say uh, I'm sure that this will just carry on? Can I thank the uh, right honourable member, who is uh, very experienced in this field and has been campaigning on it for a long time, quite rightly. We have made some fairly stringent recommendations in this report, with some fairly tight timetables as to what the government has to do by when. I can assure him that if we do not see satisfactory progress, we will call DEFRA back uh, to examine why our recommendations have not been properly implemented. So That is part, as he knows, of the PAC uh, system. Um, that we do have the ability to be able to call uh, witnesses back and find out why they've not uh, responded to our recommendations. And as he knows, as I said at the beginning of my report, they have 42 days in which to respond. And again, if we don't like the responses, we could follow that in writing, up in writing or again call the witnesses back. I thank uh, Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown for presenting the statement from the Select Committee. And we now move on to presentation of Bill Secretary Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Clark. Transport Strikes Minimum Service Levels Bill. Second reading what day? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Thank you. We now come to the backbench motion on NHS Dentistry. Peter Alders to move. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting this debate, and I also thank the Honourable Member for Bradford South for her work in helping secure it. I beg to move the motion that this House is concerned by the growing crisis in NHS dentistry, notes that nine out of ten dental practices in England do not accept new NHS, NHS patients, regrets the number of dentists moving away from NHS practice, welcomes the Government's commitment to levelling up health outcomes and dental health across the country, calls on the Government to take urgent steps to improve retention of NHS dentists and dental accessibility for patients, and further calls on the Government to report to the House on its progress on the steps that it has taken to address the NHS dentistry crisis in three months' time. I also highlight petition number 564154, signed by 11,067 people, calling for an independent review of the NHS dental contract. Madam Deputy Speaker, colleagues have been securing debates on the state of NHS dentistry for, for the past two years. This crisis has been brewing for a long time, and the situation can be likened to a house built on shallow and poor foundations which has come crashing down with the earthquake of COVID. The King's Fund describe NHS dentistry as being on life support, whilst the British Dental Association describe it as undergoing a slow death. In their monthly report for October, Health Watch repeat that NHS dental care continues to be one of the main issues that they hear about from the public, who across the country are clamouring for NHS dentistry, which is both affordable and accessible. In Suffolk, there are 70 dental practices with NHS, NHS, NHS contracts. Not one is taking on new patients. Locally, there has been some welcome support in that in Lowestoft, a local practice was granted additional units of dental activity that allowed them to see emergency patients until the end of September. And in July, the dental design studio were awarded a contract to deliver NHS dentistry for up to eight years. However, very quickly, both practices were fully booked up and have had to turn away patients. Madam Deputy Speaker, 
There is a need for root and branch reform, and I shall now briefly, outset, out, briefly set out those issues that need to be included in a blueprint pra- plan for NHS dentistry. I give way to my honourable friend. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend and congratulate him on this debate. Uh, would he agree with me that the fundamental problem with NHS dentistry at the moment is the 2006 contract and the units of dental activity? Yes. Uh, does he share my disappointment at the statement made in the summer uh, about how to uh, resolve the situation based upon the consultation last, uh, launched uh, last year? And does he furthermore hope that UDAs will be expunged from all of this so that dentists can be properly rewarded for the job they do and thus return to the NHS? I thank my hon. Friend for that intervention. I agree wholeheartedly with, with him on that point, and I will come to it in in, as I set out what I believe needs to be done to improve the situation, and I think that he and I are very much on the same page on that particular issue. I will address firstly, Madam Deputy Speaker, the issue of funding. There is a need to secure, long ter- to, to secure long-term, a long-term funding stream. In recent years, the NHS dental budget has not kept up with inflation and population growth, Since 2008, NHS dentistry has faced cuts with no parallel elsewhere in the NHS, and the British Dental Association state that it will take £880 million per annum to restore the service to 2010 levels. I acknowledge the budgetary challenges that the Chancellor faces, but the reform process is doomed from the start without an appropriate level of investment. There is a need for a protected budget, and any funding that is clawed back must be kept in dentistry. Secondly, a strategic approach should be adopted towards recruitment and retention, with a detailed workforce plan being put in place. I will give way. Very grateful to him for, for giving way and congratulate him and my honourable friend from Bradford South on securing this debate. It's, it is a crisis. It's a crisis in South Manchester, uh, as it is across the country trying to access NHS dentists. Now, there are highly trained dentists from abroad who can help. I've got some constituents who are trained at the dental faculty of the University of Hong Kong, which is in the top three faculties in the world, has an English curriculum, uh, but they can't, access, they can't get registered. They can't uh, access the licence exams. Now, I, I understand the government have said they're going to simplify the registration process. Can, would you join me in urging the government to act very quickly to make that happen? I thank the honourable gentleman for, for his intervention there. He's, he's come in at a very um, appropriate time, and he may well have been reading my speech, because that actually was the very next point I was going to come on to. In the, what I was going to say is, in the short term, we need to be stepping up recruitment from abroad. Whilst the legislation tabled earlier this month to streamline the process of recognising overseas qualifications is welcome, this on its own will not address the problem, and I hope the Minister, in his response, does, will address this particular issue. In the longer term, we need to be improving dentistry training ourselves and ensuring that this is available throughout the country. And in this regard, the proposals being worked up by the University of East Anglia and the University of Suffolk are to be welcomed. Madam Deputy Speaker, thirdly, there is a need for a new NHS dental contract, as my honourable friend mentioned a minute or so ago. It is welcome that discussions have started on revising the contract, but there is a worry that the government are only looking at marginal changes when ultimately a completely new contract is required. At present, the NHS contract is driving dentists away from doing NHS work. Its target-based approach is soul-destroying for so many, and it needs to be replaced by an agreement that has prevention at its core. And Madam Deputy Speaker, that leads me on to the fourth and p- penultimate component of a new system of NHS dentistry. 